So can you tell us, um, what was your name at birth, your full name? Uh, my full name is John Daniel Singleton. And where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, January 6, 1968. Is that where you grew up, in Los Angeles? Yes, I grew up in Los Angeles. Tell us about where in Los Angeles you grew up and what that was like. Um, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Um, it, was, uh, it was very, actually, very, very beautiful. It was a kind of an idyllic childhood. Um, you know, it had, had, its, had its moments, but, you know, when I was living in that, there, I didn't really know, I didn't really in tune how dangerous it could be or, or how volatile certain things would be. It was just, it was, that was the way life was for me. It wasn't until um, I started catching the bus around Los Angeles and going to different places and realizing that not everywhere was like my neighborhood. You wow. Know? So. That's not the image of South Central that people have, right? That it was idyllic. Well, it, it, well, it, I, I still show it as idyllic in my movies. If, if you watch Boys in the Hood, you know, the opening of the picture, um, well, not the opening of the picture, but parts of the picture. You know, you see beautiful views of palm trees and uh, Spanish-style homes and, and kids playing in the streets and, um, you know, just life. And I still look at it like that. And, and very much so is still like that in different ways. But um, there are parts of it that can, can be dicey, parts of it that can be, uh, that, you know, things can happen. And... Um, that's another, that's another level. I mean, that's, that's how any city is, actually. Mm, right. Tell us your parents' names. Uh, my parents are, are Danny Singleton, and my, um, my mother's name is, that's my father, and uh, my mother's name is Sheila L. Ward. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my father was born in Fresno, California, and my mother was born in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father, uh, in most of my childhood years, um, well, he, 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 after he got out of the, the Army, after serving in Vietnam, he went to Cal State uh, Dominguez, and um, he played football, actually. And then um, he, he took a job working for Thrifty's Drugstore uh, over in, um, in South Central off of Vermont. I think it was off of Vermont and Manchester. And um, he worked at various thrifties as a manager, worked his way up to manager, and it, it went from working with thrifties to working with another um, drug chain called Drug King. And, um, and then um, he ended up doing, seeking from that to getting his real estate license and uh, going into property management and real estate management. And my mother, she, uh, she, uh, she uh, put her stuff through college at um, uh, Cal State, uh, uh, Dominguez. Actually, my father went to Cal State LA. My mother went to Dominguez. Uh, she went to put herself to Dominguez, uh, and uh, I think she uh, was a science major. She ended up working as a, a pharmaceutical rep for, for several different companies, including Glaxo. What qualities would you say you inherited from your parents? Well, I mean, I think what I, what the chief thing I learned from my parents were that, you know, they came from very, uh, Working class family, you know, lower, 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 lower middle class families, you know, like working class families, and um, their parents hadn't had the opportunity to, to like go and and, and take and get a college education and you know just and build from that. And um, I think the chief thing I got from them was that it was actually very very cool to actually to be smart to to, to they fostered a early sense in me of um, that being an intellect was kind of a, a cool thing. You know, I come out of the out of the, the time in which my parents' formative years were in the in the late sixties, early seventies. You know, my mother was uh, eighteen when I was born, my father was seventeen when I was born in sixty eight. So it was a very, very volatile time. And I think a lot of black people in, in America were they were trying to find themselves spiritually, soulfully, and mentally at the same time so, and, and, and a, in a, a way that was different from what they had, had for over a hundred some odd years in American history. A lot of that had to do with um, making more of an identification with their African roots um, in, in, in a spiritual sense and also in, um, in an intellectual sense, you know, 
getting over what we call mental slavery, mm -hmm. thinking of, that there's some type of inferiority complex because you're black in America that, you know, you, this is going to be your lot in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, my parents were a part of, of that just on the peripheral sense of being scooped in that. That's why you end up having so many people of that generation. I mean, I, my name is John, so it's like a straightforward name out of the Bible, but you have so many people that in that time they change their names and you know the, the, the kids all have different vowels and different names because people were being creative and they were like doing something different. And so I come out of that, I come out of that generation and, and a lot of that, um, those people actually had a, a huge exposure to the arts. You know, I'm from that generation. Um, my friend Tupac Shakur, he was from that generation. Um, there are several people within the, the the first stage of the hip hop generation that came out of that that time. We were all born within the late '60s, early '70s, and so um, my going into my formative years, into the '80s, into the '90s, that made me, you know, that dictated what. Uh, how was I was going to look at uh, life? You know what my what my perspective of life was going to be. Mm. Yeah, that's really powerful. Mm. And I'm wondering how that whole mix of influences that you're describing, how that shaped the way that you thought about what you wanted to be when you grew up. Did you have a clear sense of that as a young person, like before well, high school? Well, as when I was when I was a, a young boy, actually. Uh, my first impulse was not film. My first impulse was like I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to either be a veterinarian because I loved animals. Um, I studied the the, uh, the different scientific names of animals and and the phylums and all that different things and stuff. And I wanted to just go and help animals. I wanted to be either, either that that or be a marine biologist mm -hmm. um, and you know work in terms of we didn't even think about climate change back then, but just work in terms of oceanography and everything. Those are things I were interested in. Or getting to uh, technology and computers and stuff because I used to, I was a real geek about um, the, the the first computer phase in the early '80s, learning different languages and stuff, and writing programs and everything. And um, but something changed in me um, in the sense that that I, when I was nine years old, I went to see Star Wars, and Star Wars was the first film that I I actually had seen over and over and over again. And so I started to break down how a film was constructed, and I learned that you know that of course it had to be written, um, then it had to be cast, and you know there was the person in charge of all of that, and that was the director. And the director was the person that pulled everything together, that pulled all these disparate elements together, and and, and turned them into something that will become a film. And um and but at the same time, film had always been at the periphery of my life. And, you know, I, I'd been going to movies ever since I was um, on my own since I was like five years old. There was a time in which uh, I um, disappeared for for a day with my, my friend Greg. Uh, he he was seven and I was five, and we caught the bus from Inglewood to Torrance, going down Crenshaw Boulevard, and went to this theater. And our parents didn't even know where we were. We just went, and we went to see um this double feature. One of the movies was a movie, it's 1973, a movie called Island at the Top of the World. And it's a it's an adventure movie that Disney made. But I specifically remember not just the movie, but also the experience of going to the theater by myself as a, as a, a young kid with other kids. And I'm happy I had that because there was, this was a time where you know, um, it was some. We're in the LA, but we could just as well have been in a small town because it was a double feature. And in between the the, the feature, they had you know you you took your ticket stuff, and they had a raffle, and whoever you know had the right number, you got a prize, you know. And so this was a time where yes, there was television, but there wasn't that many channels on, and people just gave their kids money to go to the movies, and you know the theater was just full of little kids, and we all went and saw the movie, and then we all. You know, some people had their parents pick them up, and me and Greg, we got back on the bus and went back to things. So um, there was that, and then the fact that my mother's apartment was right um, near what was known as the Century Drive-In. So the the back of the apartment, I could see the two screens of the drive-in. I could see, you know, I could see, you know, there was there was one screen there and then another screen all over there. So that that drive-in showed. Black exploitation movies. It showed kung fu movies. It showed horror movies, um, and so 
a lot of the films that I would see, they were like B movies, throwaway American um, AIP movies and film ways and those those third or fourth tier distributors that made those pictures that were just basically for the driving circuit. I would sit and watch them as a young kid out the window, but with no sound. And so I would see the images and stuff. And, you know, I mean, some, I, I, there's a famous joke that I always say that Pam Breer's breasts, you know, influenced me to make movies, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's, it's like, you can, I can't believe that as a kid, you know, you look out the theater and you see these, these things out, outside on the drive-in <laughs> and everything. <laughs> pretty amazing. So <laughs> that's like an amazing kind of film school to have, right? Well, I mean, you know, I I didn't then tune it as as being film school. And then what what happened was after that, after um, seeing Star Wars, and then my mother would, my mother would actually was putting herself through through um, through college, and you know, she'd had to study and concentrate, you know, and take biology and chemistry and all these classes and stuff, and so she would basically go to the library and she'd be in the upper stacks and I would be in the children's library. And, you know, basically the library became my babysitter, you know. Um, I think it actually saved me from delinquency because, you know, not only was I, I was well read, I learned how to read since I was three years old, but also I, I, I had exposure to be able to sit there, not only just read books, but, um, you know, we had no money, so they, they, they had these records. They had records. They had remember the Disneyland records, mm -hmm. and that you could you could read the story, and every time the uh, thing would go to turn the page, it would go ding. You read the, you know, the next page, and you know you could read all the all the Disney movies that I never had the money to see. I could listen to. I could listen to. I could read the story and listen to it, and go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and listen to, the, I mean, records from, from. Um, not only the Disney movies, but Barbara and musicals. Mm -hmm. And my, I, my interests were like very, very eclectic, but they were all in terms of various stories, you know, various stories from around the world and adventure stories, you know, um, classics, you know, Robinson Crusoe and, and Treasure Island and all that stuff. And, you know, um, there, there were the books, but there were also the abridged versions that were in comic books and stuff. And they were like, you know, some things were, um, um, were just they were just like these these interesting classics that were visual Sherlock Holmes and stuff, and so after a while I read all these different books in the children's library. And the children's library started to bore me, so I leave the children's library and I go to the upper stacks, and they had what's known as all I saw was microfilm. I saw film, so they had these things of microfiche, and what you can do is you take the microfiche. <laughs> of course, we have the internet now, so you don't need that. And you would roll it on these spools, and you can scroll, and you can read newspaper accounts from different um, that you know, because they would take all the newspapers from the past and they would put them on microfilm so people could do research and everything, right? Um, way before the internet now. And so I I I look and I started reading film reviews of various things that I was interested in, you know, and I, I was so fascinated because it was like when you look at something, you could be like maybe eight nine years old. And then you start to to read things, and you look, start looking, you start tuning um, time. Time becomes a factor when you're when you're a certain a certain age, young, and you're like, wow, you know, like you know, three or four, five, six years ago is is your lifetime. It's a leap. So I was sitting, read stuff from like the early '60s or or the early '70s on on different films, and I started reading film reviews. And, um, and, 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 and part of it was just like me just really playing around with the microfiche and rolling it back, running back and having a sense of the light and having the sense of the light and the, and the, and the stories flashing for me and everything and stuff. And I, and, but there was something in there, you know, there's something in there and the various stories about the film. And so somewhere in and around that line between seeing Star Wars and then reading different film reviews and stuff. I started to click in, and then also, you know, my um, I was very much a big fan of comic books. My visual acumen started going out like, wow, I'm, this is something I, I think I want to do. Mm. You know, I want to make films. I mean, I, I knew nothing about you know uh, other black filmmakers in, in a historical sense or anything like this. I just knew that that's what I want to do. There's no historical context for a person like me coming from where I was to to make films, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I was sitting in classes and I would draw and, you know, 
and say, you know, such and such and title directed by John Singleton and all this stuff and everything. And um, I formed a little club with a couple of friends. I mean, this is in fourth grade, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade. Me and my friends would make these little small animated books um, and notepads. And, and I wasn't a very great drawer. I can only do bubble heads. I still only do bubble heads when I, when I do storyboards for different things that I'm thinking about. Um, I had a friend of mine named Armin Sears, and he was a great, great um, artist, and he still is. Um, and he would, he would actually draw every frame of it, and I would direct him how I wanted to look, and we would make these little small, what we call flip books. And they were, they were basically, you know, uh, visualizations of our comic book heroes fighting and doing different things and stuff like that. And um, when I graduated in sixth grade, he wrote in my, you know, you have these little autograph books and everybody writes in your books. He, he wrote to a great friend and, and, and great movie maker in sixth grade, so. <laughs> Wow. So tell us about how your interest in the visual and in filmmaking, how that developed as you went into high school. Where did you go to high well, school? Well, well it, I have to go back also to junior high. So okay. what happened um, when I was in, when I went to junior high, I'm still in Inglewood, mind you, and um, I go from Woodworth Elementary School to Monroe Junior High School. And, you know, you know as, as everyone knows, when you make that leap from childhood to puberty, it's like hell. It's hell on earth, right? And um, you know everyone's finding themselves, and there's a kind of a you know feeling out kind of thing and stuff. And I felt that I was was pretty much adequate student. You know, I thought I was. I think I was smarter than than my grades reflected. Um, when I was in sixth grade, I I uh, one of the hallmarks of my career, one of the best awards I ever got was sixth grade. Uh, I got a award for uh, reading on placing. Uh, reading on a college collegiate level mm -hmm. in sixth grade, and it was like wow, you know. I, it was, I, I still I don't have a trophy now; it's lost somewhere. I think my father has some in the garage, um, but it was a great honor to me. But when I got in seventh grade, I spent so much more time like worried about defending myself and, and fighting different forces. You know, different people. You know, everybody. You know, you have all this male testosterone, people filling each other out, and so. I became really, really hardened and angry, and and um, you know, hey, this is just real. You know, um, my father was a manager at this drugstore, and he, he, you know, he would work in the stock room and all that stuff, right? And so um, he, would, around the house, you know, you open up these boxes, he had all these various box cutters, and so like my, you know, these cats, you know, I, I had these big glasses and everything. People always. Some people would think they were messing with me and everything, but and and I was very much in the comic books and movies and everything. Like this and I was like, you know, but I was always like very very calm and methodical and very very thinking person. And so I, I think people, but also where I'm from in in, in L. A. You know, if you're one of the smallest guys, you got to be willing to do anything <laughs> to keep people off you or let them know if they mess with you, then that's their ass. So I would carry a box cutter with me everywhere, you know? And so um, I just lying in wait for anybody to ask me if, uh, you know, try to take my money or anything. And one time, you know, this guy tried to do it and I went after him and I slashed his jacket up. And, um, you know, that caused a little commotion with some people and everything like this. But that's not what really changed my, my life because, you know, people knew, okay, you know, hey, this still, that, that's not keeping people from messing with you. They just know whatever. What happened was I had I went to school one day, and um, from the seventh to eighth grade, beginning of the eighth grade of the year, I had um, there was a rule against bringing Afro picks to school, and I, and I had a little smaller Afro, and this cool cool Afro comb, right? It had this it had this thing at the top of it that you could put in um, stuff like to moisturize your hair, so you could not only pick your hair out, but you could also get this. It was a little plastic thing, some dude that, that my father found downtown that he was like selling around, right? And so I'm in wood shop, and the teacher sees me messing around with this comb. And, you know, they don't want you to bring combs to school because they say they could be used as a weapon. Well, I got a box cutter in my pocket. I'm not going to use no apple pick if somebody messes with me. I'm going to use, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to get something going to get done in another way, right? So he goes, Singleton, 
didn't you hear the rules against bringing metal combs to school? And I'm like, what? You know, give me that comb. And you know, snickering kids, he snatches it out of my hand. This is some guy that obviously did not want to be teaching, right? You know, he was teaching in woodshop to all the knuckleheads. I didn't even want to be in fucking woodshop, right, with these assholes, right? He's, he takes his comb and he saws it three times. <laughs> on the saw, make a whole show of it. And he puts it on the workbench. And he I look at this and I'm, you know, it's my comb. I love this fucking comb, right? <laughs> I'm gonna cry right now, right? So, so I take the comb and I look at it and I look at him. The whole class is laughing at me. And I said, fuck you, you motherfucker, right? And I walked out. I walked out of school, get on the bus. I go to see my best friend, the guy's still my best friend. Um, his name is Michael Winters. Um, everyone, He's, he's from, um, from a gang they call uh, the Hoover Crips, right? He lived on 101st in Vermont, where my father lived. And we, we call him Fatback. In the movie, Boys in the Hood, he's known as Doughboy. But in real life, his name is Fatback. We call him Fatback. And I'm like, man, you know, I'm in trouble. I can't tell my father I, I'm not in school. I'm a drop out of school. And I'm in eighth grade. I'm smart as hell, man. He said, man, he says, fuck that shit, man. Get on the bus with me at Bret Hart. You know, you go on the bus, you jump on the bus with me, go up to like Tarzana and go to school with the white boys. You don't have to worry about that shit, right? I said, okay, fine. So the next day, I get up earlier. I go over to his house. His grandma makes us breakfast. His mother drops us off in front of the school, Bret Hart, which is on, um, on Hoover. Um, they're Colden. Colden's like one of the most dangerous streets in LA. And so I jump on the bus, nobody looks at me. Then I go on go on the first tourist trip ever off the 405 freeway early in the morning into Tarzana. I go to the office, I fill out the car myself, and I'm going to Portola Junior High School. And it changed my life because it was the first time I went to school where it wasn't particularly just blacks and Mexican kids, where I wasn't totally fighting all the time. I still had to fight because I had to worry about the kids we go in my own neighborhood, we're on the bus, so we were all fighting each other at the school in the valley. But what was different about it was, it was, it, it, it was, it was a time in which the San Fernando Valley in the early 80s, 1981, it was pretty much, you had all these uh, uh, newly people immigrated from Israel, and it was Japanese immigrants, right? And just people, a lot of people who worked in the film business, there were children uh, of, of the people who worked in the film business. Uh, there was a guy there, kid that actually his his father was a uh, casting agent for Spielberg and did you know all of his films. Um, and um, so just very people. And all these kids, since they were the, the, the sons and daughters of people in the film business, especially pretty much the sons, because they, they all they all were like aspiring filmmakers in some way, because they had they had a kind of exposure to it. It was in their family thing. And so, you know, people would talk about film. They would, um, you know, some people had Super 8 cameras. Um, uh, I had a really good friend of mine. Um, uh, he wasn't a white guy. He was a black dude who lived in my neighborhood. Uh, his name's Carl Austin. He's a screenwriter right now. He actually lives in Ireland. A brother from my neighborhood, he lives in Ireland right now. And he, and he writes Bollywood movies now. <laughs> Go figure. And so, um, he he and I bonded. He was a real big geek. He used to he used to get the novelizations of the latest movies that would come out, you know, um, whatever it would be, like you know, Blade Runner or whatever. And he would, you know, he would read the novel, and then he wouldn't read the end because he didn't want to ruin the end of what the movie might be, right? But we started sharing different novelizations of pictures, uh, of movies, um, comic books, trading them, and then. Um, you know, there were people who were into looking at the illustrations of, like those drawings that Roth McQuarrie did for, for Star Wars and 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 um, and Empire Strikes Back, and we we were, we were like a kind of a think tank, you know, but in junior high school, of what was happening in the, in the larger world, and every movie that would come out, we would get together, and we would like you know pontificate about how good it was going to be, you know, we were so excited when. The 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 um, the the second World War movie came out and the Raiders of the Lost Ark came out like you know um, the Super Superman two and we were like you know we were really like in the in the mold of of wow you know this is you know 
the, at least the pop culture thing of it. You know, this is something interesting that, no, and not everybody was thinking about actually being a filmmaker or whatever, I mean, but me, it started really coalescing and clicking in. And I only went to that school for one year, but it changed me. It really, it, 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 it something clicked off to me that like, wow, this is something that is very, very accessible to me. And so going in um, to high school, I ended up going to three different, um, more high schools. But my goal started to be um, that if I'm going to be a filmmaker, I have to go to film school mm-hmm. on, on the collegiate level. Mm-hmm. And I knew that uh, I had to go to USC film school. I wanted to go to USC film school because I had read this book that Dale Pollock had written about George Lucas called Skywalking. And um, I read it in, I think, around my ninth grade year. And um, and I was like, wow, you know, you know, I, I think I, this is something I want to do. Mm-hmm. And in... I think it was the fall of 1985, I had stumbled onto the, the, the campus and they had just built these new facilities at USC. Uh, George Lucas had rebuilt the film school for the first time. He's actually built it a second time now, right? And uh, I was like, wow, you know, I saw the George Lucas instructional building and the Marshall Lucas post-production facility, Johnny Carson um, uh, television stage. And I was like, wow, I want to go to school here. Like, you know, it's just like, this is real for me. And I had this, I remember walking down the second floor of the 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 the, the big building, and I, I used to always carry a book with my hand, and different books I was reading. And I was reading a Stephen King's Skeleton Key, which is a collection of stories that he had written. And um, I see this old man walking down the hall, and he, the door closes, and it was like, it was a dean office. And I knock on the door, and the guy opens the door and said, oh, you know, hey, I'm going to go to school here. And I said, oh, what's she is? She says, man. And he shakes my hand, and he turned out to be Russ McGregor, who was the interim dean of the, of the film school. He takes me in his office. He talks to me, gives me his card. And so I started hanging out on the campus for the next year between my 11th and 12th grade year. And mind you, it really galvanized me even more to, like, you know, basically bring my grades up and, get ready for college and all this stuff. And so um, I helped out on a couple of student projects. Um, and uh, I knew that the production the production um, side of, of the school was harder to get into, but the writing side of the school um, was hard to get into too. They only, they only entered 24 students a, a, a year um, in production and writing. But writing, someone had told me that the, the cheapest way to actually make a movie is to write a movie. So somewhere along the way, I was like, wow, you know, like for what I want to do, I have to learn how to write scripts and I can still shoot stuff, um, and which I had been doing anyway. I'd, I, while I was in, uh, in 11th grade, I'd been taking classes at Pasadena City College where I had access to, to uh, film equipment and I'd shoot small films, you know, with people I knew in high school and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I apply to USC, I get into USC, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be a game changer. And one of the things on the application that I wrote to US when I applied to USC was they used to have this thing, I don't think they do it anymore, you have to state three different types of films that you want to make. And so you give the title of the movie and a certain synopsis on the movie. And one of the movies that I wrote in that I wanted to make was called Summer of 84. And it was about three friends growing up in South Central Los Angeles amidst the chaos of, of their neighborhood. You know, and that's all I wrote. And it was on my application. It was like one of, one of three ideas. And so I ended up going to film school, and it's a revelation for me. Because, you know, although I'm, I've, I've gone to a couple of revival theaters, I, I'm, you know, I used to go to and my 11th or 12th grade year, I started going to art films and going <clears throat> to the different, different movie houses and seeing not only contemporary foreign films, but also um, older films, you know, like went to the Rialto Theater, which is in South Pasadena. I remember one time I, my, I was bugging my mother, I'm bored, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do with it. She's like, I said, uh, she, she, she said, well, take the car, she said, go, go to that old movie theater, go see something. And I went to the Rialto Theater, this is in 11th grade, and I sat down, and the first film I ever saw in, in a, a revival theater was Woody Allen's Bananas and Annie Hall. And I was like, wow. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're just, you know, 
cinematic and comedic classics, you know, but they're also revelant. And they're also mediations on life and, and politics and different things, and sexual politics and stuff, right? And I felt grown. I felt chic, right? So I'm watching it. And then, then a week and a half later, I go to a midnight screening of Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. You know, and there's all these, you know, college kids and all this stuff out there. And, you know, I'm 16 years old. And I'm like, I'm really doing it, right? So I get to film school. And I'm a know-it-all, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm, at, I'm in school. Uh, my friend Brian Singer was there at the same time, right? You know, he had his little clique and stuff like this. And there, there are all these, we're all, you know, we're all cinephiles. We're all trying to do a kind of one-upsmanship of what we know about film and how much our, our, our nascent knowledge is of, of cinema and all this stuff. But we really, none of us knew shit, right? And, you know, th that's one thing you know when you get to film school. You think you know everything, but you know nothing. And just to really be in an environment where I'm watching these films, and some of them I've seen different parts of them on, on television, but watching, you know, being in my uh, uh, Cinema 190 class, which is taught by, by a gentleman named Drew Casper, and he, um, he's really, really flamboyantly, flamboyantly gay guy who just loves movies, and he just like, he shows you Citizen Kane up on the big screen. He shows you Singing in the Rain on the big screen, right? You know you see Chinatown and you like, you know, you see what film can be. And so I'm like, wow, this is something. But at the same time, none of these folks look like me, right? Great, great characters, great, great, it's, it's great, great filmmaking artists, but none of them look like me. And so two weeks before I started school, another benchmark happened. I went to uh, a theater in Santa Monica that was showing uh, 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 a, a movie that had been showing in New York for about a month and a half, and it was going to show in L.A. for for a few weeks, and it was Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It. And I had heard of this guy because of my mother, and he had a mutual friend that went to Spelman College when he was in Morehouse. This is, uh, this is in, you know, in high school. And I was uh, early in the year when I was in my senior year, second semester of my senior year in high school, um, I got a flyer to go to this house and, and see a bit, bits of the movie because they were trying to raise some money uh, after this, the, I think the San Francisco Film Festival after he won an award set for finishing funds to get ready for Cannes. And I showed my mother the flyer and she said, nah, you can't see that, it has sex in it. It's like, you know, I'm supposed to go see this guy, beat this guy. And her friend says, you remind me of of, of my friend Spike, you gotta meet this guy, right? So I go to this movie and I'm like, wow, you know, I saw Spike out front, you know, he's passing out buttons and talking to people. And I, you know, I tell him, man, you know, my mother's friend Tracy Willard said, I should meet you. And then they says, okay, well, go join, go enjoy the movie. And I go look at the movie, I'm like, wow. And I see, like, I see Black Brooklyn on the screen for the first time. And it's like, and, and it, all of it's like, color and glory and and candor and stuff right you know really authentic it's not a sifted portrait of what certain people want black people to be and it's like wow it's just uncut right and so i come out of it i'm charged up and everything and stuff i come out of this and i always whatever anybody says about spike i always remember this moment and he talks about it sometime because everyone came out of the movie theater and you know he's the wonder kind he's the next big thing to slice bread and so all these Hollywood types are floating all around him and stuff. And then he sees me, you know, on the periphery of all this. And he moved everybody out the way and he comes up to me and he says, what'd you think of the movie? And I said, I love it. I told him merits, you know, I told him what I thought about it, you know, you know, just seeing, you know, these beautiful black people on the screen. And then I said, and I'm going to USC film school in two weeks. Watch out for me, I'm coming. <laughs> So I went to film school with that attitude, like, wow, this guy's doing something, right? He's doing something a little, you know, just totally different from the norm. And there's all these stories and the whole wealth of African-American history and also contemporary culture that have never been told that from an uncut thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also coming from, I'm from the hip hop generation, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like ensconced in, in, in the hip hop generation. I've grown up in hip hop. So I'm like, I, I want to do something totally different. And I'm, no, I'm pretty much one of the only black students at the, at the school, and I have no family in the business. So my whole thing was, you know, I'm, I'm like, 
I'm going to approach this thing as like a warrior. You know, I want to be the first round draft pick in film school. Just like they get these kids to come out uh, of college, and sometimes they finish college and they go play in the NBA or play in the NFL. I'm going to do that in the film business. And so that was my whole thing in going to film school. Nothing else. It wasn't about partying, it wasn't about drinking, anything else. I would study film, live life, I, you know, and I would just try to be the best I can. I'd make, I couldn't make them any real movies because I was in a writing program, so I'd had to write. So I would just devote myself to that. I'd read scripts, I'd, read, I'd watch movies and stuff. And, and as I started doing it, um, you know, I wrote one, one screenplay called Twilight Time, and I won a, an award for it, um, the Robert Riskin Award. Robert Riskin was a screenwriter that wrote a lot of Frank Capra's greatest film, films. I wrote that and I also won the Jack Nicholson Writing Award for that screenplay. And so I took that screenplay and said, okay, I made it, right? Got me some notoriety, went around Hollywood, tried to get an agent in my, my junior year of school. Uh, no, girl, you only wrote this. You know, we don't know what else you can do, right? And I'm frustrated and stuff. You know, I think I had some promise in her and then this. And then it's the summer of 1989. And mind you, every time Spike came into town with a new movie from She's Gotta Have It to School Days to, 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 uh, to Do the Right Thing, he would have these book signings where he, you know, he was always the master of self-promotion, right? He'd write a book and he'd, you know, he'd, you know, he was selling t-shirts, you know, everywhere and stuff. And, you know, and um, I'd see him, you know, at these book signings and we were on a first name basis while I was in film school. And, and then Do The Right Thing comes along in the summer of 1989. And I go to a sneak preview of it. And my eyes are like blown open. It's like, it's like I think it's the best thing I've ever seen before, right? You know, and I'm with my friends and, and he comes out of the theater surrounded by an entourage and stuff. And then my friends are like, go say hi to him, go say hi to him, right? And I'm like, I'm just in, and awe now because this movie is the best thing I've, I think I've ever seen. And I'm like, no, nah, man, I don't want to say nothing to him, man. Fuck him. <laughs> I don't want to say nothing to him, man. Nah. Go say hi to him. I said, no. Nah. And I'm just like, they said, what's wrong with you? And it's like, I'm like, I'm ruining this. Just... And I'm, I'm, mind you, I'm going from into my senior year in, in college. And I'm like, I got to do my own shit. Yeah. I can't go talk to him. I got to do my own shit, right? You know what I mean? And I say, like, and I just go back to my, my, my little one room apartment and I'm just ruminating. I'm listening to James Brown and I'm listening to, to Aretha Franklin and I'm just like stewing this stuff. And I just said, you know what? I gotta do something for Los Angeles. I gotta define myself different from any other filmmaker, whether not Spike or Spielberg or anybody else that I admire Scorsese. And it has to be something unique to me and who, who I am as a filmmaker and what I can bring as a storyteller. And in film school, they always say, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And what do I know? I know South Central Los Angeles. So I just started hanging out with Fatback and some of my old folks and then listening to um, NWA and, and ACE's album. And I said, I'm going to make this movie. It's going to be called Boys in the Hood. And I started writing this screenplay. And I, I don't have a computer of my own, so I have to write it in the, in the lab, um, the computer lab. At, at USC, which is like a collective, you know, you have like maybe 24 different computers there and you have one disc and you write your paper and you write your paper, you put it on your disc and then you go print it out somewhere else. Well, I'm writing the screenplay, The Boys in the Hood, on, um, on one of the early Microsoft Word programs because they didn't even have screenwriting programs back then, right? And, um, <laughs> and mind you, when I write, I not only do I write it, but I also improv the dialogue as I write. So I'm saying the dialogue to myself while I'm writing it. And I'm, I'm being loud, I'm using profanity, and I'm like, you know, and I'm standing up and standing over it, and people are watching me and stuff. And you know, you're supposed to be really quiet, like it's the library. And so there are people write, writing their dissertations, they're writing papers and stuff, and some guy says to me, can you keep it down? I'm like, shut the fuck up. Don't you know I'm writing a fucking, fucking classic movie right here? Get out of my face. You mind your own damn business. And I just go in my, just keep going in my thing, right? And just keep on writing and just keep on, you know. And um, we were doing it for, we were doing it for a class, you know. That had to be, as my thesis um, script, you had to write it either, you had to write a script to get your, your degree. 
And so this is the fall of 1990. And so you had to write it by, um, no, the fall of 1989, you had to write it by the spring of 1990 to get your degree. Well, I wrote it in the fall of 1989. And, you know, was, I think my teacher was uh, a woman who actually wrote about screenplay, Vicki King. She actually does a thing, how to write a screenplay, and, you know. And, and so she says, well, you guys tell me what grade you want and maybe you'll get the grade, right? And I said, listen, I have no time to come to class. I'm going to write this damn screenplay. I'm going to give it to you, and I want an A, right? <laughs> so it's like everybody's sitting in the class, you know, they're writing, they're ruminating about why they can't write, why they have writer's block, and everything. I'm writing. I'm writing my shit, right? So I write this screenplay, and I edit it and everything and stuff, right? I come to class. I think I missed three or four classes and stuff, right? And I used to, I, I was the kind of guy, like, you know, I enjoyed, like, really, like, you know, scaring the white people, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I was that kind of guy. It's cool. Because right? I, I was intimidated. I was the only black dude at the whole school, so I had to intimidate people, right? And there's one guy, right? So I'd give them, I give I, I, I was, I would bust their chops and stuff, the teacher's chops and stuff. I said, listen, I said, here, here's my screenplay. Boom. I want an A. You better give me an A. <laughs> so she says, okay, okay, John Singleton. We'll see. We'll see about it, right? So she reads the screenplay, The Boys in the Hood, right? <laughs> she sees, reads the screenplay, The Boys in the Hood. And I come back in, I, I just go in, because I'm, I'm now in, I think I'm now in, um, I'm now in, uh, in, in the fall of my senior year, and I'm like, I gotta find a job. I, I mean, like, I'm later for school. I gotta, like, be a reader. I gotta, like, you know, try to figure out, you know, what's going on production-wise, if I'm gonna be a PA and stuff, right? I don't have time for this shit. You know, I got loans coming up, right? And so I go back to her. I says, what I get? <laughs> and she says, you got a day. <laughs> she didn't talk to me about anything that was in the screenplay or anything. She just, you got a. And so I ended up taking the screenplay and I, I, I applied for some different, some different more awards. And I won the award that I won the year before the Jack Nicholson Writing Award again, which gave me $5,000 to go to graduate school. Mm. So I applied to graduate school, I took the GRE. I got into graduate school by the skin of my teeth because I didn't have, I didn't have A's, but I had uh, like a B plus average in school. And there was a professor named Paul Lucy who advocated on my behalf to get in the, into um, graduate school. And he said, listen, he doesn't have the grades, but this guy's got the talent, you know, they let me into graduate school. And, and so I ended up, um, you know, uh, thinking I'm going to go to grad school, you know, and continue on and, and shoot some stuff, maybe shoot some, some parts of the script or shoot some other stuff. This is the MFA program. It's the MFA program at USC mm -hmm. in production. And so I ended up, um, but I ended up getting represented by CAA off of, off of the strength of Boys in the Hood. Uh, my first agent was Bradford Smith, and he went to Yale Rep. And he, he used to work for Lloyd Richards. Um, and they developed uh, August Wilson's early plays in Fences. So he worked on Fences on Broadway, and he had read Boys in the Hood, and he said, you know, he said the magic words. He said, you know, I read this. You remind me of August Wilson. We want to sign you. We'd love to sign you. And, then, and mind you, um, I left out of my chronology that I saw Fences in the, in the, in the production that came after it. it won all the Tonys in the, in the mid-'80s. It came to Los Angeles in, I think, 1987, and I saw it. Uh, with the original cast and James Earl Jones, um, I think um, Madge, it wasn't um, it was Madge Sinclair that ended up playing the mother, not um, mm. not um, um, the other actress, Courtney B. Vance, who I ended up working with on the People vs. Roger Simpson later on, um, and it, it 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 inspired me so much that I wrote the first screenplay that I wrote. And August had always been, since then I I went to all of his plays, you know, that when the productions would come to Los Angeles, so. And I, I had a very a huge affinity for the way in which he used language and and, and and tone and the way he would you know bend words and they were they were uniquely um, they, uh, I think the right word for it is negroid in, in in the way that the people would talk you know with some cadence and some soul you know you know you could feel you could almost feel the the, the brown liquor on their voices when they spoke right and so for him to say that. I was like, wow, you get it, you know. And so I signed with CA, which at the time was the most powerful agency in Hollywood, head by Michael, Michael Ovitz and Ronnie Meyer. And um, 
I was 22 years old and I had an agent and I was still in film school. So you really couldn't tell me nothing. I still didn't have a pot to piss in, but I had I was with the biggest agency in Hollywood. So they started sending me out on different meetings and I always wanted to say like, give me a lunch meeting. Because I, you know, I had no money. Or like, At least these people are gonna feed me, right? So uh, they would set me up different lunch meetings as a writer. And I ended up, my first true gig was uh, getting signed to do uh, writing a show for HBO mm-hmm. called The Champ. It was about a boxer, the first year in a boxer's life. Mm-hmm. And I ended up um, writing that. And as that was happening, things started going on with Boys in the Hood. You know, um, I got a meeting with Russell Simmons. I pitched the movie to him. He gets up on the MGM Grand, Grand, Grand that's going from LA to, to New York. And he, um, I had no idea he had an impending deal with Columbia Pictures that was he was negotiating. And he says, I, you know, this is the best screenplay I ever read, and I don't even read. <laughs> and says, I want to. This is the first movie I want to produce. It's called Boys in the Hood. And they, um, they like, oh, that's that's John Singleton. It's like they hadn't read the screenplay at all. Nobody read, read it because I, because I take these pitch meetings, and they say, well, I want to see, you know, I, I pitch it. I said, this is the movie I want to do. And they said, let me read. It. I said, no. That was about the tease. I knew, I knew that the talent was about the hype. Mm. So uh, Stephanie Elaine, her, who was an uh, executive at, at, um, at Columbia, had heard that Russell was interested in it. She gets the screenplay from the woman that I interned with, not from my agents. She reads it. She's like going balls out. She goes to her group, the creative group. We have to make this movie. This is the kind of movie we have to make. Nobody wants to make the movie. So they, they, make, they put it over the, the weekend read. Nobody has her back. Frank Price who's the president of the studio, he says, he says, this is interesting. He says, let's call him in for a meeting. They called me in for a meeting. It's Frank Price, who's the head of the studio, president of the studio, Michael Nathanson, who's the president of production, Stephanie Elaine, um, who's a creative executive there. And so they already know, I've already said, I'm directing this movie. I hadn't directed a movie before. You know, I hadn't even had done a, a, a short with Sync Sound, right? I done super eights, and I'm not gonna show them my super eights, right? So they say, um, we understand you want to direct this movie. That's Michael Nathanson. I said, I am gonna direct this movie. Well, what makes you think? What, you know, like, what makes you think you can direct movie? I said, because this is the movie that me and my friends sat on our stoops talking about that should be made. When we catch the bus from Hollywood, seeing something else that you guys make, this is the movie that we said sh- kind of movie that should be made. They said, well, what if we told you we would give you $150,000 and we're like, yes, some man does. I said, well, we have to end this meeting right now because, you know, I'm making this movie. You're going to make the movie. Somebody else is going to make the movie. I have nothing. I have nothing. <laughs> you know, because so, I, I learned from my father, he says, the best way you sell somebody on something is when, you know, they sell themselves on it. You know what I mean? Like the, it's, it's really like that, you know, they have something that you want that, that they are predisposed to buy anyway, right? And so I said, this is the way I want to do the movie. And I laid it out how I want to do the movie. And then uh, Frank Price always says, you know, uh, I, I said, instead, instead of renting helicopters, I can just also put light over the windows and then put the sound in afterwards. And so Frank Price, to his credit, says, you know, I had more moxie than any young filmmaker he met since Spielberg. So they gave me $6 million and said, go make the movie. Now I'm scared because all the shit that I talk all through school, I got to back up. Right, so I, I locked myself in my apartment. I end up, I got a VCR, and I watched all these great movies that I always loved. Then I also went to the studio, and um, and I started like uh, having the projectionist run different films I loved. I ran Ch- Taxi Driver, I ran the Godfather trilogy. You know, um, I ran contemporary films I really liked. I, uh, Gus Van Sant's uh, Drugstore Cowboy. Um, and um, so stand by me, Rob Reiner, and so and uh, and I would and I'd be in the screening rooms of Columbia, and I'd invite all my friends from the neighborhood to come, to keep me company while I'm watching these films. And Stephanie would say, "John, you know you're running all these movies, and you know it's costing a lot of money." I said, "Isn't this what filmmakers do? You look at movies before you make a movie. You're supposed to look at a movie, movies, because you're gonna run a movie, right?" And so, yeah, but it's costing. I said, "We got. We said we got to pay these guys." I said, you pay them? Aren't they just there anyway? 
Aren't you paying them anyway? <laughs> so, that's, so, so I watched I watched a lot of pictures and everything going on the boys, and um, and then we set up office. This is in the neighborhood. My office is still right right across the street. One of my offices is still cr- right across the street from where we set up the production mm-hmm. office um, on Degnan, 43rd and Degnan. Um, and um, we started casting the picture. I called up uh, Fishburne, who I'd known from um, when I was 19 years old. My first job, my first real job in the business was as a production assistant slash security guard at the door of the stage on Pee Wee's Playhouse. And so I, in that, I met uh, Larry then, Larry Fishburne, um, who was Cowboy Curtis. And so we kind of like bonded and he was talking to me about, you know, because he had just done a movie with Spike School Days mm-hmm. at the time and I was asking him all questions how it was Spike and all this stuff. And, um, and one day he comes to me and says, you know, how do you, man? And I said, I'm 19, man. He says, he's like, go on, brother. And I said, one day I'm going to write something for you. Watch this. I'm going to write you something, right? So he gets the script, and, you know, this is three and a half years later from mm. us meeting, you know, 19 to 22. He remembered you. And he, of course he remembered, because he'd see me around town, we'd talk and everything and stuff. And um, he's like floored. He's like, wow, he's, he's emotional about it and everything. And he signs on. Wait, could, it, was that the best thing that came out of your experience with Pee Wee's Playhouse? Or were there other things that you learned was, oh, about no, I mean, no, that, the business? That was there. one of the best things that came up. But the other thing was just like, you know, just Paul Rubens and um, and just seeing how Paulie put together that production and and, and the production design and, it, and the, just the way in which the crew was. And I think I learned from Pee Wee's Playhouse that, you know, when you have, when you have to work as hard as you do on any production, it's nice to have a great rapport with the crew, and you know, and they really, really take care of the crew. The crew, crews, you know, crews, film crews or television crews, they're like families. You know, it's like a, cir- a circus troupe. You really you bond for a period of time, an extended period of time, and then everybody goes off to the next show, mm-hmm. to the next thing, different thing. So I think I learned that much from working with Paul mm-hmm, Rubens. Mm-hmm. But it did make you think you wanted to stay in television at that point. You were still focused on. I still was Cinema. focused on film. It was, yeah. it was just a whole thing about being in, 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 in film and everything mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I ended up doing, uh, um, uh, out of doing that, I ended up later on doing an internship with Arsenio Hall on the Senior Hall show. And in that in that case, it was in 1989, um, just before I wrote Boys in the Hood, um, I was a director's intern in, in, in the booth, and they would do multi-camera. And so I, um, I was watch the director go and officiate, like, six, seven, eight cameras and, and, and look at the monitors and go, okay, get ready on one, get ready on one, and go to one, and, mm-hmm. uh, and get ready, and uh, four, and line up four, line up three, and go to, go to four, like this. And so it was interesting. That came back to me later on when I ended up doing television, mm-hmm. um, like doing the People vs. O.J. Simpson. You know, we had four cameras going, right? It's the first, second time I ever did television. And so I intoned when I was 20 years old and watching it, so I'm like, I'm doing mini master shots on three I'm watching different okay now go back to such and such on this one and so it just clicks in to me what I'd seen done a variety of shows but I'm doing it in a filmic sense I'm not doing arbitrary shots to get some musical performance or something mm-hmm. I'm doing this okay get ready and telling you after get ready and I'm and I'm it says okay now go on three move it I'm telling them that so it's like putting a puzzle for me directing is like directing is like um, putting a puzzle together you know, you, you not, and there are all these disparate elements. You know, there's, you know, there's the actors first and foremost. You know, there's there's camera movement. You know, there's also later on there's sound, there's effects and stuff, right? And so, it, it, the fun of it is how you can juxtapose all that stuff in a very very cohesive way to tell a story, a very powerful story. The difference between film, I think, and and television is in television. You have a, 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 a small, finite amount of time to put to put this together in an elevated sense, but it's so small. The window is so small, so you, but you have to make sure it's elevated to the level of film. In film, you have a little bit more time, you know. Mm. Um, so that's fantastic. And I guess the other thing I just wanted to ask about the Arsenio Hall show. It was really revolutionary in terms of all the people of color that it brought. To yeah, that. yeah the, the great thing. I, I was I was at Arsenio the Arsenio the first year that it happened where it was the only variety show that actually would put hip hop artists on, R&B artists on, um, you know, different people of color. And 
everybody wanted to be on that show because it was the hippest thing around. So it was like, you know, the, just the hippest television stars, mm -hmm. the hippest film stars would come on. Um, and um, it was the start of something really, really big. Mm -hmm. With the environment on the set, what was it like? It was, the, the environment was great. I mean, uh, and one of the things that came out of that was, um, Arsenio Hall was me actually meeting Ice Cube. Um, because uh, if I hadn't been at Arsenio, I wouldn't have met Ice Cube. I was backstage. Uh, he was with N.W.A. Uh, he was by himself, but he was he was he was with the group N.W.A. And he was with a friend of his, I think, who was a friend of Tone Lokes. And they were trying to get backstage, and security was stopping them. They said, "No, you can't go here." And I was like, "Man, you know who this is? This is Ice Cube. He's with N.W.A. Hey, man, come on, come on, come back here, man." So I walk him back into the green room. I said, "Listen, I go to USC Film School. I got a movie idea. Watch, I'm gonna make this movie, and you're gonna star in it." I think I'm all you guys in the I hadn't even read the movie yet. It was just an idea, right? So okay, cool. So, you know, so we exchanged numbers and stuff. And um, and then he, I see him somewhere else around and stuff. And I said, I'm, I'm still working on that movie, right? This, you know, we're going to get it together. And then I saw him at another thing, event, uh, The Palace. And he had performed with Public Enemy. And this is the first time that he actually had quit the group. And everyone in L.A. was like, you're, you're, you know, you're dumb. What did you do? You, you quit the, the, the biggest group ever. And he was in the parking lot and some guys trying to like insult him and tell him why. Some guys trying to insult him at the same time tell him why he needs him to help his career, right? And we get into his like Suzuki site. I said, man, you know, listen, my, my friends left me. I don't have a ride back to campus. Can you give me a ride back to campus? He don't know nobody else but me, so. Cube gives me a ride. We're getting a Suzuki Samurai, and we start going down the 110 freeway, down the Harbor Freeway. Um, he's going to go see his girlfriend, who has been his wife for well, over 20 years, and I'm going to campus, and he starts playing these beats. And the, they're beats um, that the Bomb Squad, the producers for Public Enemy, have given him for his first. He says, this is the beats to my new solo album, America's Most Wanted, right? So he's playing the beats and stuff like this. I said, oh, remember that script I was telling you about? I said, I wrote it. I said, I said we're going to get it together. So we plan these beats, and I'm talking about the movie that, that I just wrote. Eight months later, we're on the set. That's incredible. Eight months later. That was early 90, 1990. Eight months later, we're working on the movie. Going back, when he gets the call for, 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 for Boys in the Hood, he's like, what is this? What is this? So he, he comes in, and he's like, I said, yeah, remember me? He's like, oh, yeah, damn, damn. You were serious, right? So he gets a screenplay, I said, check this out, I want you to read it. He goes, he comes back, he does his audition, and he sucks. It's like, oh my God, I'm like dying. I'm like, Ugh. and I'm like, did you read this script? He says, nah, man, I've been busy, I've been, I've been touring. I said, go home and read my script. Just read the script. You gotta, you gotta read this script, come on now. I, there's nobody else can play this part. So he goes back and reads the part, and then he's just like, he has a revelation. He's like, damn, I can do this. I know this guy. I know this thing. So he comes back in, and he does the part. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's very rarely happened to me before, but you see like a movie star right there being made, right? You see a movie star right there. And it's like, I saw it already, right? But he just had to get the, you know what I mean? And so, so he just comes in and does it, man. And, um, you know, and then so now I got I got Fishburne and I got Ice Cube. You were gonna talk about casting, but maybe we could take a step back for a second because you were talking about your writing process. Mm -hmm. You talked about your friend Fatback mm -hmm. and how this influenced the character Doughboy. But maybe mm -hmm. you could talk about the development of some of the other characters. And I'm thinking especially about Furious Style. Well, I mean, the characters are all people from my life. The characters in Boys and Hood are all people from my life. I mean, Furious Style is obviously based on my father and um, Character Rio is based on my mother. I mean, uh, Trey is loosely based on me, and Doughboy is based on my friend uh, Michael Winters, Fatback, and Ricky is kind of an amalgamation of, a, of, a, of another friend of ours, Jimmy, but he wasn't an athlete. He actually ended up going to the Army. Um, and all those characters really are people from my life that are dramatized in a different way within the, in the film. Mm -hmm. you know. And how many of them did you have specific people in mind to play the characters as you were writing? I had nobody in mind to play the specific characters in Boys of Hood except for Fishburne was Furious and Ice Cube was Doughboy. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I mean, I always had that in mind. It's never been like that ever since in my career where I actually had people in mind to play the roles and I got them. The actual actors that I wanted in developing the screenplay that I got them, it hasn't happened since, ever. Wow. Now, I don't know what it is. It's like, you know. <laughs> so say more about the casting process then, especially as a first time director, how that worked. Um, well, I mean, as a first time director, my casting process was uh, kind of a, uh, kind of pedestrian you know if I saw somebody I wanted they were it. I wouldn't go for like three or four different choices and whittle them down it was like this I mean Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, came in he was the second person to read for it um, and uh, for, for Trey the first person to read for Trey was Morris Chestnut so he came in right I said okay he's he's good he's good and then Cuba came in and Cuba comes in he has this <laughs> this black shirt with a big yellow spot on it from Chess King or something like that, or one of those 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 stores that, you know, uh, we used to shop at in high school in, in, um, in the mall. And I was like, oh, he's he's a pretty good guy. You know, it's like, you know, I said, well, you know, and so um, I said, so, and I had him read with Fish, and he was good. And I said, you know what? He's gonna be Trey, and the chocolate one's gonna be Ricky. I'm going to lunch, bye. <laughs> and then Jackie Brown was like, we have to see all these other actors. I said, I don't want to see any other actors. Those are the dudes that I want. <laughs> wow. So usually, and I mean, now you go, like, you go through, like, you have three top choices, and you, 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 you can vetch over all the different, different three choices you send to the studio. They look over it, and they give you a review and stuff. And back then, I was just like, that's what I want. Mm. And then um, Angela Bassett um, came about because... I asked Fishburne, like, uh, what are the two actresses, you know, you know in, that you know that are the best actresses now that you want to work with? And he said, Angela Bassett and Tyra Farrell. And so I had them come in for respective roles, and they were there in the picture. And everybody else is peppered in because they're all friends of mine. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like I, you know, Jackie Brown was saying, like, you can't, John, you can't put your friends in, in your movie. That's like, I'm the director. I can do whatever I want. I can put my friends in my movie, right? This is the neighborhood. I can put all my friends in the movie, you know? <laughs> and was this part of your desire to make it authentic? No, it was just, I just didn't know any better. I, I think, you know, I, I, I was kind of like, um, I was naive. I was just like, I'm making a movie and I just want to, you know, I'm going to have all my friends in the movie. Wow. So Jackie Brown's a little frustrated. Talk more about the crew and how that came together and how you interacted with them. Well, the crew... Um, I was on I was on some real uh, black shit. <laughs> I was like, listen, I want an all black crew. Spike does it with a pretty much all black crew. I want an all black. I'm an all black Spike, right? <laughs> I'm in South Central Los Angeles. I don't want anybody to be like looking at us like we're some occupied by force. And so um, Steve Nicolaitis, who's not black, he's, he's a cool white dude, you know, radical hippie, sixty hippie, you know, liberal dude, you know, <laughs> he's he. He worked with Rob Reiner. So he worked with Rob Reiner, Princess Bride and Misery, and he was my line producer, and he, became, he was a producer. I met him through uh, Stephanie Lane. I said, I don't want to see nothing but black people in you. <laughs> so Stephen McLeod said, I don't care if I'm the only white guy on the set. I said, you will be, you will be, right? So he goes and he puts together this crew, and then, mind you, all these people who worked on Poison Hood were either they, they were veterans. They were people who had worked in the business for maybe 25, 30 years. They were older people. I'm 22. These people were maybe in their late 40s, some 50s. And they were maybe the one or one or two per, black person on pretty much all these crews all these different years. So they're coming to this and they're like, wow, look at this. This is, a, this is some different, this is some different shit right here, right? And so they, they basically were like, you know, my uncles and aunts, you know what I mean? Like they, they pulled me in, and everything. but I was still very, very hard on them because I was like, this is new for me. I was like, this ain't no damn party. You know what I mean? Like we, we happy to be working together, but I want y'all to work hard, you know, on this, right? So, um, but it was, it was, it was beautiful because a lot of people actually lived in and around the neighborhood in which they were shooting. So we were shooting. So people were like, some people were like five, 10 minutes away from home where they were just like, They'd be right on the set and they'd be home. So it was, I learned, that's one of the things I really learned about shooting and kind of when I shoot these urban pictures of having as many people as I can from the environment working 
not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Because what it does is it gives a kind of spice. It gives a kind of a life, a different kind of life that, you know, because when we're making any kind of film, we're in the service of um, recreating the spontaneity of life. We're rec that's, all, that's all filmmaking is, whether that's fi great filmmaking or good television. You're recreating the spontaneity of life to, to do what? To have some type of dramatic emotional effect on an audience, you know, where you're pulling them in in a, in a kind of a voyeuristic sense to, to whatever story you're trying to tell. So for me, it's a very calculated effort, whatever I'm doing, to do that, yeah. you know, to, to, to get that. How do I get that spontaneity? So can you remember some stories about what it was like shooting in a place where people aren't accustomed to, to movies being shot there? It was a revelation. I mean, you know, people people were just enjoy it. I remember when I was shooting in my neighborhood on um, in Inglewood in the area called the Bottoms, um, where I'm walking around on set with all these people, and people are like, "What you doing here, man?" And I was like, "You know, I was like, I'm, I'm working on this." And I said, "What you doing?" I said, "I'm the director." You're the director. You the director? I said, "Yeah, I'm the director." Yeah. I said, "What?" They like come out. Everybody come. Look, John John directed. He directed, right? And so we had this scene. There's a shot in Boys in the Hood where the ki the kids walking up the street, and he crap passes this crap game, and then the people, the stunt players, get into a fight, right? And so we're like, okay, we're setting the shot up. They do the rehearsal, and and then mind you. Um, it's a long lens shot, so you're looking down one side of the street. The other side of the street, there's 300 people watching. From, everybody comes out of all of their apartment buildings watching. And a lot of these people are people I went to elementary school and some junior high school with, and their parents. And so I'm like, okay, let's get ready. Everybody quiet, everybody quiet. Everybody's silent, church mouth silent. Do the scene, you know, action, do the scene. The car goes up into this, and I go, and I yell, Cut! Everybody in my neighbor goes, yeah! And I'm like, I mean, I wish I had it on videotape because that was a really, that was a, for me, I mean, I could, could cry mm -hmm. right now because that was, I mean, I'm just remembering right now. That was like, it was the first day of shooting. So I'm like, it was like one of those things like, wow, this is like, this is kind of a reality. Mm -hmm. This is, <laughs> That's giving me chills. That's yeah. an amazing story. That's because it impresses upon you not just that it was your individual achievement, but yeah. this is something that's like going to transform your whole oh, yeah, community. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was great. It was great. Whew. <laughs> okay, that was, <laughs> that's an amazing story. <laughs> so off of that, I yeah, kind of yeah, wanted yeah. to ask you about like, <laughs> these are people who are not used to films being shot in their neighborhood. They're not accustomed. Black people across the country are not used to films being made about their lives in this no. way. No. You've talked about yourself as an L.A. filmmaker, like mm -hmm. a quintessential L.A. filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Can, could you talk a little bit about like what it meant for you to add this neighborhood to the images of L.A. that exist on film? You know, what you what well, you thought me, you might do differently. For me, it was just really about, um, I feel like uh, me as a storyteller, I have a responsibility to, to tell things that I'm interested in, but also, you know, I'm giving voice to people that don't have a voice to, to tell these types of stories. So it's just like whether or not it's Boys in the Hood or, you know, um, another movie that, that I love in my over films, Rosewood. You know, it's like, it, um, if I don't tell the story, then who's going to tell the story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel like you were um, teaching the country something about Los Angeles they didn't know before? Not at all. I mean, I, I was just thinking about teaching. You know, I was just thinking about doing something that was like, different and like relevant and authentic to, to who I am as a person. It's a, me making a film is like me having a conversation with the world. It's like me having a conversation, it's me as a unique individual having a conversation with the world. That's what films are for me. It's me having a conversation with an audience, with a mass audience, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's transferred over to, to television too. So, mm -hmm. you know, the TV shows that I do, they're, they're extension of, of who I am as a person or the things I'm interested in. I mean, that's why very much when, when like Ryan Murphy and Nina Jacobson and Brad Simpson were doing People vs. The Simpson, I called them up Cole Cock and I just said, I called up Scott Alexander, I mean Scott Alexander and Larry Kazowinski and said, you guys, because they went to USC, I was like, guys, I got to be a part of this. You guys are doing L.A. story. I am, you're not going to get anybody more L.A. I knew O.J. I mean, I met him a couple of times, you know what I mean? Like, 
but I, you know, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, come on, let's come play with us. And so that's <laughs> how I ended up doing that, yeah. you know, because yeah, yeah. it's just, it was just part and parcel of something that I was interested in. And these guys were playing and they invited me to come play along with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about um, representing violence in mm -hmm. that film, but mm -hmm. more in general, you mm -hmm. know, like what's your approach to that? Why you feel that that's an important element to capture in your well, work? Well, um, I mean, up until Shaft, <laughs> I, <laughs> I said I wasn't going to have any kind of like violence that was like uh, gratuitous or like celebrating violence as a kind of a cowboy mentality. And it's like, it's so funny, like I ended up doing Shaft later on, I was like, oh my God, now my life is over. I'm having people get shot for, for, for the enjoyment of an audience. If you look at all of my movies before that, anything time anything violent ever happened, it was a, there was an emotional impact. There was a, there was a, um, there was some loss, you know, um, and so, um, and I always still, as much as I try to, to do that, whenever I have something that something violent happens in a picture, there's an there's an emotional there's an emotional undercurrent to it. There's it's not something to be celebrated because I think it's something about me as a person that I've grown up and I've seen so much stuff at a young age that um, I'm still affected by it. So that as a storyteller, I try to be very very responsible in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you have? Um issues with, you know, the ratings board or what's your experience been in terms of violence with um, language no, I've maybe never, too? I've never had any issues with the ratings board. I mean, like the, the stuff I, it's funny, the stuff I, I do on film is relatively tame compared to kind of like the, the murder porn things that other people do. You know, I think the only issues they've ever had is that the fact that the st some of the things are so, they are very emotional. You know, it's like, you know, it, it, you know, it, it hits you on an emotional level. I think that yeah. that's what, and sometimes that's more disturbing. It's easier for people, um, American audiences are so endeared um, to, to see violent acts, you know, like that they're like, like sexual acts are like, oh my gosh. But, you know, to, to cut this member and do all these different things, it's like, oh, okay, you know, it's uh that's just, you know, that's just the horror thing, you know. Wow, yeah. <laughs> so you were recognized so widely for the success of Boys in the Hood, including um, Academy Award nominations. Mm -hmm. What did it mean to you to be nominated and for the historic aspects of those nominations? I, I was very humbled. I was, I was very humbled at the same time. I was like, um, I didn't really allow myself to enjoy it because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I still had that kind of chip on my shoulder. Like, you said I wasn't doing it, and I did it, and I did it in a different way than nobody else do it. So I was like... You know, okay, that's fine. Now I gotta have a career. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't. Thank God I didn't like go like, oh my God. You know, hey, you know, I I, I didn't because that, that what it gave me was a drive to, to continue to do good work and not to sit up. You know, twenty some years ago and just have that movie and I hadn't done anything else. Right. Um, and what it did for me is it gave me even more resolve to to take. You know what I was trying to do seriously. You know, recently I just got nominated for an Emmy for Best Directing for People vs. Under Simpson. And people asked me, so how do you feel? And I said, well, I kind of been through this before. And I said, what do you mean? So, well, I got nominated for an Academy Award at 22, and now I got nominated for an Emmy for Best Directing. I said, and I still feel the same way that I did then. I said, well, I guess I need to think about taking this job more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and this directing thing, this director shit, I got to take it more seriously now. So. And and for me, the Emmy nomination was because I I decided to try to forge a, a, a different path in television because filmmaking has evolved and changed. It's, it's very difficult to do dramatic work on film, but but television, you know, is such a great exploration of different uh, different ways to dramatize things and, and different time frames and story arcs and everything and stuff. And it's really intriguing to me mm -hmm. because you can do things that you can't do on film. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can extend the life of different characters and the, and the, and the, the satellite worlds of different characters. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you a little bit about the Remember the Time music video. Yes. How that project came about? Um, that came about because uh, Michael Jackson called me. And... Um, it's, it's it's crazy because there's there's um well I have to go back before I talk about my dress I'd say this <clears throat> there's only two people that in, in all of entertainment that I was ever nervous to meet those are like my idols right 
they are Steven Spielberg and Richard Pryor. And I have two stories. I was at the comedy store because I used to hang out at the comedy store a lot um, after Boys in the Hood. And I'd go see different comedians perform and stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are young, you know, some of the Wayans brothers and, mm. and some of the young comedians that were in the early 90s before Def Comedy Jam and everything. And so um, I'm there at the comedy store one night and this man comes up to me. I think his name was David Banks. I think he was Richard's right hand person. And he says, you're John Singleton. I said, yes. Yeah. Mr. Pryor would like to meet you. And I said, oh my gosh. So I go across the room and Richard is there and I think he was there with Al Pacino. And I love Al Pacino. God, you know, Godfather one or two, Scarface and everything he's done. But I'm looking at Richard. And so he's Richard, he his MS was not as bad as it got yet, but it was just it was slightly there. And he's really he's frail. Very really self-assuming, he comes, unassuming, he comes up to me and says, you know, young man, he whispers, talked in a whisper, you know, young man that made the movie? And this is right when Boys It came out. And I say, yes, sir. And he comes and he brings me and gives me a hug. And I cried, I cried. Because I listened to Richard Pryor's records, you know, sneaking my mother's <laughs> records and listening to them low, you know, and, you know, and admire him so much as a storyteller and, you know, his rhythm and cadence and his, his just the soul that he had, you know, as a black man and, and how he would politically infuse his humor with different things and take jibes at Nixon and the the uh, the whole kind of uh, the whole uh, institutionalization of racism. Like he has this great joke that's like, you know, he's like, you know, he says to, to talk about people being different, you know, it's all about some damn cash, you know, like racism is all about some damn cash. He said, that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like, you know, basically like you can take some people and, and because they look different, tell them you're going to work for free you, and we're not going to give you shit and we're going to treat you like shit, you know, and we're going to get rich. So that's it. And he just, what, the way he breaks stuff mm-hmm. down, you know, he's like August Wilson, you know what I mean? August Wilson mm-hmm. and Richard Pryor, you know, so, so that was the thing. And I used to hang out at his house, you know, and just, he was, he, 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 be sitting at his bed, he had a gun right by his bed, and he'd be smoking his cigarettes, and all these comedians from all over Hollywood would come in, and they'd sit up and try to almost stand in his bed, like, want to get a piece of him, right? So I got a chance to see him, and he, as he kind of, like, degenerated, you know, with his MS and everything and stuff to the point he couldn't really talk. But, you know, he's he's still a very, very phenomenal um, presence in my life. Whenever I feel anything, I'm going to, Recharge my storytelling batteries. Mm. I listened to Richard Pryor, mm. Steven Spielberg. I I saw Steven Spielberg first when I was uh, nine years old on 2020. I think he was directing Close Encounters, and um, and and it's like that's what I like. Okay, that's what a director does. He's mm. like on he's on the crane. He's telling everybody what to do and something. Like that. Then I went to see Close Encounters of Torrance and stuff. Right, so boom. I, Followed every one of his movies as a kid, you know, through my teenage years and stuff. And you know, he was the boy wonder kind. He was the guy who, who snuck onto the Universal lot and acted like he was an executive's kid. And he sit with the editors and, you know, and you know, he he would sneak onto the sets and he would watch things and he would make these small films, you know, and 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 he ended up getting a, a television deal at the age of like, I think twenty one. Said Scheinberg signed him to do television. You know, he couldn't give him a feature, but he did some television. Then he did this TV movie called Duel mm-hmm. that was a phenomenal success and it did well in Europe. And then he got a chance to do Secret Line Express and then he did Jaws, which changed the whole nature of the business with Blockbuster. Mm-hmm. So he was the boy. So when I was going to film school, all the white kids wanted to be Steven Spielberg. You know what I mean? I said, I, I'm not going to be Steven Spielberg, I'm going to be John Singleton, but I can go in and I can try to do a movie. And be younger than Steven Spielberg in my first movie, so that's why. <laughs> so when I, he was doing a movie called Hook in 1991, and um, before Boys came out, and um, I remember hanging out with a group of my friends, and these are, these kids are not street kids; they're like black middle class kids that I knew whenever they were around. And I had this hat that says South Central Cinema, right? And they were like, "Oh wow, the, this is the Hook set." Spielberg was working over there, and um, and Sure enough, he comes out and he's on a, this big rock cell phone, 
and he's talking. I was like, oh my God, look at him, he's over there. And, it's, and he's like, go talk to him. My friends are like, go talk to him. You can talk to him. You can talk to him. <laughs> and so I said, fuck it, I'm gonna go talk to him, right? So we walk out of the set of Hook, the pirate ship and everything and stuff. This is before the CG stuff. And Robin Williams, God bless his heart, he sees us all coming. He sees all these black guys coming. He looks and Robin Williams like, he walks away, right? And Stephen looks at us and he says, oh, he's looking, he clocks my hat. He says, oh, South Central Cinema. He says, is that USC? I said, yeah, I went to USC. My name's John Singleton. I said, okay, you know, we meet each other, say hi, a little bit. And then Kathy Kennedy had him watch Boys in the Hood. Hmm. So then we ended up having lunch, you know, a few weeks later. And so I'm like, I'm sitting here, you know, with my idol of idols, you know what I mean? Like, you know. And, you know, it, we ended up forming a friendship over many years. And I, I, I've learned so much more from my casual conversations with mm-hmm. him about film and in life and everything. He's, he's a consummate. As much as his movies are great, great mm-hmm. visualizations of their stories, this guy can tell a story orally better than anybody else. <laughs> the stuff that he's... And I, that's one thing I learned from him. To, you know, they say great stories tell us can spin a yarn. He can spin a yarn the way he just, you know, what I, I asked him, hey, did you ever meet Hitchcock? He says, he says, the way, the way he tells the story about how he met Hitchcock and sneaking on the set of Torn Curtain and seeing Julie Andrews from afar. And, and, and he's, he, and then, and, and it's over there and he sees Hitchcock and he sees Hitchcock behind a chair and he's going walking over and he's just about to tap Hitchcock's shoulder and he gets stopped by security. <laughs> Steven Spielberg, young Steven Spielberg. And he's like, and he doesn't get any chance to even, Hitchcock doesn't even turn around. But the way he tells a story is like one of his movies. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and he, he can spin stories like this. So it's like, it's whimsy. You know, he has a kind of a whimsical mm-hmm. sense and everything. Then you get the opportunity to meet Michael Jackson. Okay, so Michael Jackson. So I always knew I was going to be Michael Jackson. I mean, it's just like, it was just like, I knew I was going to be Michael Jackson. I grew up listening to Michael Jackson from, a childhood listening to 45 records, you know what I mean, in elementary school when they had a little 40 record player. So I wasn't surprised when I met Michael Jackson. I wasn't, I wasn't um, nervous. Mm-hmm. He had been part of my family, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. literally my whole life. Mm-hmm. And so we sat up and um, we chopped it up and he asked me what I thought of his album. He had an album, ooh, I'm coming up dangerous. I said, I, I like the, the, the tracks that they were playing on black radio. and. These are the tracks I'm interested in. You know, if you wanted, he asked me what I thought of the last video. I said, that's eh, all right, but I think I can do better. You know, and I was just, it's just because I'm, I'm a kid and I'm just like, I don't know, I'm supposed to hold back and say, I'm just like, this is what I think. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to put you with a whole bunch of black people. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, what do you want to do? I said, well, let's sit and top it up and figure out and let's do something. And so as we started talking about it and I was writing up, he would add elements. He said, you know, we should think about getting Eddie Murphy in this. And I said, let's call him up. We called Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy was down. Um, we put it together and we're thinking about getting him on it. Let's call him on, let's get it out. And then um, and then um, Irvin Magic Johnson came out and, and, and did that big press conference mm-hmm. about his, his HIV status. And then, and then Michael said, you know what? We should do something for Magic. Find something for Magic. Let's do something for Magic. And we put Magic Johnson in it. Wow. And so um, and that's the kind of person Michael was. Um, and we shot it on the uh, Universal lot on the, the biggest sound stage there. I think it's stage eleven, and um, we, you know. That was well, your first sound stage experience. That was my first. Yeah, that's my first sound. It was the biggest sound stage, one of the biggest ones in Hollywood. So how was, was that there. different for you in terms of you know? Well, I was used to shooting on location in small environments and small homes and two, 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 two family homes and on the streets, and I go right to shooting on the biggest sound stage. I was just. It's like it was like you know when you're in it you you don't even know you're in it just in it that's okay like, hey, this is the, what life's gonna be like. Mm. But what did you do differently in terms of what you could do with your camera angles or with? Uh... Well, I mean you know there you know I'm able to to to, to you know work with luma cranes and uh, techno cranes and different heads and stuff and I, we called together um, some of the best best hip hop dancers in in, in in the country that people who had worked with. Um, you know, Joe C and Mary J. Blige and all the hip hop stars got a chance to work with Michael Jackson, who they had studied from all his videos in the 80s. And um, I, my choreographer was an extra in Boys in the Hood, Fatima Robinson. She was 19 years old. I brought her to do Remember the Time. And she's like, can I do this? I said, 
we're going to teach Michael Jackson some new moves. Yes, you're going to do it. And got her with Michael, and it's, it was just magic the way they, they put it together and everything and stuff. And Michael was, my, Michael was such a, a, a phenomenal student of dance and, and movement and everything and stuff, and, and, and also minimaliz minimalization of movement. You know, he, he, he studied Bob Fosse. You know what I mean? He studied Fred Astaire. He studied all of the, he, he gave me a laser disc player and gave me Busby Berkeley musicals, you know, Gold Diggers in 1933 and 35 and stuff, right? And then we incorporated that mm -hmm. stuff within the, um, the body of the, of the piece, but we did it with kind of a hip hop tendency mm -hmm. to it, right? You know, um, it, was a, it was a phenomenal experience. Wow, fantastic, yeah. Was there any relationship between working with Michael Jackson and then working with his sister Janet Jackson for Poetic totally Justice? Different. It was totally different because I, I had met them totally disparate from each other. And um, Janet actually went to the school I talked about, Portola Junior High School. She went there a year. She was a little ahead of me, you know, kind of periphery. So, um, um, and you know, but our relationship doesn't go back to them. It goes back to, you know, me seeing, I was I used to hang out on the set of uh, the movie Hook. I was I would tag around Steven because I, I, that, that, that year when Boys and Hook came out, uh, Columbia Pictures was doing Steven Spielberg's Hook, Francis Coppola's Dracula, um, and what else were they doing? Um, they were doing, so I, went up, I was like basically the kid that made a movie, and I would just go and I'd, I'd go and hang out with Steven, I'd go hang out with Francis, mm -hmm. I'd watch Francis' film, I'd sail up with Francis in this thing he had called The Silverfish, where he'd sit up and it's like a camper, and he had these different monitors and stuff, and he, and he, he would, it's kind of like a television studio, and he would direct from it and everything like this. And I mean, these were people who I had studied not only in school but in life in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. um, what they'd done filmically and stuff. And they were just getting to the point where they were, you know, older men and wanting to impart knowledge. And so I would just, mm. I would just suck it all up. I would just suck it all up. And everything that they, they taught me in our casual conversations is all gone in my films for all of these different years. You know, um, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, doing creative blocking with, you know, choreography with the camera and the actors and stuff. A lot of people, they try to make camera, camera dictate the actors, you know, but the actors are the organic element. The actors have to dictate all of the different movement. Hmm. It's like. To be a good director, you have to have a sense of all of the arts. You have to have a sense of painting, photography, mm -hmm. dance, literature, music. You know what I mean? So you, you, all those things come into play whenever you're making any type of small decision. Any type of small decision, whether or not it's the macro mm -hmm. or, or the major decision, comes from your immersion within all of those arts. And... Um, I wouldn't say it took me years to understand that. I think when I was younger, I had a kind of an intuitive sense of what that was, mm -hmm. and I did it But because when I started to have some maturity about me and, 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 even, and, you know, and, and having a, more of an immersion in all, all those various arts, that's when my, the way I personally express myself and what I do has evolved and changed and become different. Mm. So all of that then, is it affecting your writing in a different way once you have oh, a yes, movie definitely. under your belt? You know? Definitely, definitely. It affects the writing as well. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh. So as you're developing poetic justice then, they go back to that moment, you know, mm -hmm. um, what is it that you're trying to achieve with that project? How does my Well, that movie, work? I mean, I was like, what, I was 23 when I wrote it, 24. I was like, that movie, it's, it's a good movie, but it's not as good as I would want it to be because I, I wrote it really quickly. I'd say that. A lot of people say, oh, it's one of your favorites. Their favorites. It's because I wanted to do something more um, benign and 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 heart a different heart heartfelt in a different way than Boys in Hood. I want to, you know, Boys in Hood is such a kind of like a male dominated machismo kind of thing mm -hmm. that with the second movie, I think, you know, what are these? What are these? What what's the toll of of this youth violence taking on these young women? You know what I mean? Like you know, so that was my whole crust about that. You know, mm -hmm. like uh. And the sense of uh, of how do you have romance within this environment? Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I I want to make some type of exploration of that. And, and and mind you, with the huge phenomenal success of Boys and Hood, I had to get another movie out quick. And so I I I was writing it and everything, and I ran into Janet ser serendipitously on the hook set, and I said, I'm writing a movie for you. She's like, Oh. 
like any actress, she's like, oh, the video says, well, this is what I want to do. So give me your number. <laughs> she gives me her number, we hang out, and it's up, and I'm writing it, and there this, and I was able to go to Columbia Pictures, and I said, I got my next movie. This is what I'm doing. Okay, John, do you want to do it? And I says, no, I'm doing this movie. You guys want to do this movie or not? So okay, well, who do you want to start? Janet Jackson is starring it. How about that? Okay. <laughs> she hadn't done a movie. So, and um, actually, Ice Cube was supposed to be opposite her. And he and, and he was like, I can't do no romance. I said, You're a good looking dude, man. I said, you know, chicks like you. I can't do that. And I ended up seeing a sneak preview of, of Juice. And I had known Tupac peripherally from around, you know, just around through Queen Latifah. I met him in New York and then I saw him around LA and in the Beverly Center stuff. And so I called him up and I was like, hey man, I saw your movie. We gotta chop it up. Um, you want to do a movie with Jan Jackson? He's like, yeah, I'll do a movie with Jan Jackson. So well, you got to come in and screen test. So we screen test Tupac and Janet because they were nervous about either either of them or both of them acting. And mm -hmm. we screen test them together. That scene in the um, that's in the um, in the um, in the beauty salon at the desk, magic, green light. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. It's a good thing that I was young and and it has you know sometimes the flaws helps them because the flaws, the, the flaws, the flaws in the language and everything and stuff of, of, of the cursing and all that stuff make everything that's very, very erudite and very, uh, um, you know, er, elevated mm -hmm. play very well. I mean, I, I feel bad that when I showed it to Maya Angelou, she was like, ah, oh, the cursing, the cursing. <laughs> And I said, yes, man, but the cursing. And I was like, oh my God, it's like your grandmother telling you, like, you know, my boy, what are you doing to me, right? So, um, but hey, you know, the movie did well and it got me over the hump. <laughs> it got me, <laughs> it was a successful movie financially and, and it had some memorable moments and, you know, started a relationship with, 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 with Janet and Pac, you know. Um, the tragedy of it is that it's the only movie that Tupac and I were able, able mm -hmm. to do because the, we, we formed a kind of a, a kinship on that picture that, you know, I wanted to write songs and he wanted to like write and direct movies. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to show him how to do that and he was showing me how to do the music for me. Um, the movie that I did after Poetic Justice, Higher Learning, mm -hmm. he was supposed to star in. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that for him to star in. And it, I mean, like, he was going to star in that movie. Leonardo DiCaprio was going to be in that movie. Gwyneth Paltrow was going to be in that movie. The original cast of Higher Learning, like, you know, it's a good movie, but if you think about who was supposed to be in that picture and then what ended up happening and all these dis disparate people ended up falling out of it, it's like, oh my God, it was, it was going to be a revelation. It was like, you know, I was trying to do something that was like, yes, it, you know, it had these broad symbolisms and messages in it and everything, but it was like really much a youthful picture of the time. It was an amalgamation of what was happening in the hip hop scene and the grunge music scene and stuff, right? Um, Nirvana had just come out, you know, and the hip hop music was at its zenith. And so it was like, I was putting all these different disparate people together within a college campus and making, you know, <laughs> magic. <laughs> Were you reflecting on your own college experience in that? Yeah, some of that was USC. <clears throat> some of it was like, you know, it was like a little ding at USC a little bit. You know, USC didn't give us permission to shoot the movie on the campus. Mm -hmm. We ended up shooting at US, UCLA and making it look like USC. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> and that film has, um, you collaborated with Saul Bass, right, for the opening. Saul Could you Bass, talk about yes, that yes. experience? Saul and Elaine. Yeah, I, yeah. I, um, that came about because I, I saw, you know, of course I saw the work that he did so well with so many different filmmakers, including Hitchcock and, and um, what he did with Vertical and Cycle and um, Marty Scorsese started to use him. And I was like, you know, I just wanted to be around um, legendary people. And I just mm -hmm. called Solomon Lane in and they just, they did a, they did a title sequence for me. It's like, a, it's like I gotta, <laughs> gotta step it up, you know? <laughs> Incredible. Um, so let's talk about Rosewood. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is your first uh, period film. Yes, yes. What attracted you to that project, and well, why, why did you think that was an important story to tell? I read an article in Esquire magazine about the Rosewood incident 
And I saw it, it was on a newsstand. It was on a newsstand in Robertson. Robertson and, um, I think of Robertson and Beverly. And I, I opened up Esquire. I used to go to newsstands late at night and not buy the magazine. I just read the articles in the magazine. I just leave it up there. <laughs> not that I was cheap, but just like, I was just, just at the end of just going, you know, just out of lark and reading it. So I read this article and I, and I, it's not that I didn't think anything of it. I just like, that's just terrible, right? And then John Peters, who actually was running the studio when I did Boys in the Hood, but he ended up um, coming out of, uh, uh, of that deal at Sony. He bought the rights to the, the, the Esquire article. So John Peters called me up and said, I bought the rights to this thing. I want, I want to do it with you. And, um, and so uh, you know, I, I looked at it again, and then he sent me down to Florida. <clears throat> and mind you, this is the first time I'd ever been around people who actually had been victims of mm. like, you know, of historical institutionalized racism. You know, like, you know, like as I, you know, I've been down to the South before on, you know, on trips and stuff. They send black kids down South a little bit for the yeah. summer and stuff. But to actually be there with people, these people were in their, some, at the time they were in their 70s and 80s, mm. some in the 90s. And they were telling me the stories about what happened, you know, in, in 1922. Um, you know, doing, doing when their town was like burned and you know that man was taken away from them, and people were murdered and killed. You know, by this incident, Roswell incident, and um, and I was like, whoa, you know, you know, I was I was floored by it. I originally had plans to do this other picture that uh, Frank Price brought the rights for me for um, um, a book called Makes Me Wanna Holler, which I still mm -hmm. want to do. And so um, I, I was like thinking, okay. This is interesting and stuff, right? And I'm leaving, talking to these people, um, and and mind you, the the younger generation stopped me. The, now, mind you, they're in their 80s and 90s, so the younger generation is like in their 60s, right? The 50s and 60s, and there's these like thick black women, you know, they got the big old arms and stuff like this and like this, like the you know the big mama arms. And this one woman, I forget her name, but she's an aunt and stuff, right? She's like, she say, she's like, baby, you gonna do the movie, right? I said, well, ma'am, I got to get back to L.A. and I got to look it over and stuff and I got to, like, think about it and everything because I'm still thinking I'm, maybe I'll do Mixed Mahala and maybe I'll figure this out. And then she says, she, she pushes me with all her, with all the boobs and the arms and everything in the corner. She says, no. <laughs> I was like, no, she says, she says, baby, you have to do this movie. This, you have to do, if you don't do this movie, it's not going to be, the story's not going to be told. You have to do this movie. She says, listen, I said, okay, ma'am, you know, this, 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 this. I'm, I'm trying to get past her, you know, and these big old boobs and arms and stopping me and stuff. She says, listen, either you do this movie or Steven Spielberg's gonna do the movie, and we don't want him. <laughs> she says this to me, right? <laughs> and I said, okay, ma'am, right? So then I go and I start, I get, I look at the article, I look at the, the old newspaper accounts, and then I started reading about how there were several soldiers coming back from World War I, and they were black men who fought, you know, they were the first ones who actually fought outside of the country, you know, for, you know, for the freedom of this country. And their exposure to Europe and, and, and you know, and, and fighting the Germans and everything, you know, changed them mentally to have to come back to deal with institutionalized racism in the South. And so, and there's just always this, this falsehood within um, American um, historical records and everything like this, that black people were so benign in their persecution. And, and I've always hated that because, you know, in my family, you know, they tell stories about, you know, we didn't always get our ass kicked. You had to, you fought back, you had to move. That's why a lot of people, um, the Great Migration, you know, when all this stuff, it was not just the Great Depression. You have people who were, who were persecuted economically together poor whites and blacks, it's going to be some stuff, right? Some, some shit mm -hmm. happening. So a lot of people went up to Chicago and New York, but within those skirmishes of the institutionalized racism, there were, there were rapes, there were murders, mm -hmm. there were assaults against children. And black people didn't all just take that shit around. They, they fought back, you know what I mean? So, but they, they, you know, the white mainstream never writes about that. So, um, and I just said, you know what? I know that this happens. My, my grandparents and great grandparents know this happens, that people fought back. 
if there's a, if there's a character in here that's from the that's come back from the war, I can I can find a kind of a sense of uh, uh, things things of some type of re resonance with contemporary audiences that is historically based in fact that I can put within the story because that's what they were saying in the accounts. They said some of the World War I veterans were fighting back once their families were being murdered. And so that, you know, that's how that came about, the character of man that I got Bing mm -hmm. Rames uh, to play. So I, I caught up Bing Rames because I loved him in Pulp Fiction. And I said, you know, um, mind you, it was, it was possible it was possibly going to be Denzel Washington and, um, and uh, Tom Lee Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, but Denzel wanted me to wait and he had said, you know, maybe Tenzel said one thing wrong. <laughs> he said, maybe we don't know it was a white guy that, that did this. And I said, nah, man, I can't wait for you, right? <laughs> and then my mother said, you got to get a black man that's kind of uncut. Like, he's not chiseled. He's like uncut. And this guy, Ving Rams, looked like Jack Johnson. And, um, and so uh, Ving Rams, I said, you know, if you do this movie with me, nobody will, f will remember that you got fucked in your ass in Quentin's movie. <laughs> So I promise you, <laughs> I'll make you look so badass that nobody remembers you got compromised in that movie. <laughs> and I still make fun of him too. <laughs> and so Marion Doherty, who's a classic, classic um, casting director, um, she did a lot of movies with George Roy Hill. And she, she, you know, she did so many different different pictures over, over time. She discovered so she did she did I think she did Midnight Cowboy mm -hmm. um, with John Schlesinger, um, Mary Dorian and associates. She was in New York for many many years, right? Um, we're trying to figure out who's going to uh, who else is going to be in the picture. And she says, "Why not John Voight? And I was like, "Wow, you know," because John had taken a hiatus. So John comes in, he has a meeting with me, and we're sitting there sizing each other up. And I'm like, I'm fucking sitting here with John Boyd. I'm like, wow, you know, like, you know, from, from coming home to, to Men at Cowboy to a great movie that he did, uh, Runaway Train. I think he was nominated for Best Actor for that, too, one of Andre Konshalovsky. And, you know, we're just talking and stuff. And so we went, me, Ving Rhames, John Boyd, and um, Don Cheeto. We went down to the South, and we went up making this movie. And we, we, we took two or three acres and we built two towns. We carved out both of these towns out of swamp land. We, we moved houses. We sat up a mile length of railroad track. We airlifted a, a vintage train from the 20s and put it on there, on the track and everything and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And we made the town of Sumner, which was the white town, which was a company town, which was based on the lumber industry and the cedar mill industry and stuff, right? Where the company actually owned the homes of the people, they owned the store, they kept those people in, and you know, there were white people kept in economic persecution. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? They had to work at this company and the company would just keep them in debt. Mm -hmm. And then you had the black town um, of Rosewood where because it was segregated, they basically were subsistence livers. They had mm -hmm. they had to grow their own food, they had their own livestock, you know, um, they could sell they could sell um, um, I guess it was, um, yeah, they, they had a little bit of cedar and they said, mm -hmm. think of the turpentine, they made turpentine and stuff. And because, and they, they weren't rich, but they had their own thing. Mm -hmm. there, there was this economic tension. So what I was trying to do was show people that, you know, that a lot of this stuff in terms of, it all goes back to the old Richard Pryor joke, a lot of this tension comes not just from the differences of how people look, but also people having assumptions of, of well, like the character says, like, you know, you know, like, why does that nigga have a piano and I don't have one, right? Mr. Cumner, who's the rich white guy on the hill, who's, who's fucking everybody, he has a piano, you know, and that nigga got one, I don't got a piano. So that's what racism mm -hmm. is. It's like, you know, it's just, it's just like, who's, who's got a one-upsmanship on anybody? Yep. And so I, you put in that and an unoccurring of that and you have a kind of combustibility. So you have even more of a moral conundrum on it. And I think that that's what makes that picture more profound because um, there's not the broad strokes of villainy and there's shades of gray, you know, of, you know, of right and wrong and mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, Esther Roll's performance in that film is very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Could you talk about that um, relationship? Well, Ruby D was supposed to play that role and she pulled out of me like 
two days before, and I wanted to work for her for whatever. She said, baby, I can make more money speaking than doing your little movie. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, my God, I don't have a mama. What am I going to do? I don't have a mama. And so uh, we were like, well, who can we get that when these white folks kill this black woman, that everybody black in America gets mad? And it was like, well, shit, we're going to get Florida Evans some good times. <laughs> It's like, yo, everybody's going to go crazy then, right? And we called up Esther two days before. Esther, listen, I really need you to get down here. I'll pay you this. Please, honey. And she came down and she did the movie. Mm -hmm. I had fun working with Esther Ross. She was like in the late 70s. She was from Pompano Beach, Florida. Mm -hmm. She lived in that time that this thing actually happened. She would tell us stories about how her father would not let her or any of her sisters as a young girl work for any white families because... You know, like that movie, The Help, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. These women were going through real shit. They, they, could, they could be raped, and they couldn't say anything, you know what I mean? Because they're under segregation. So and even my grandmother would tell me stuff like that. And so, um, um, you know, she did, she did a great job. There's one, one, uh, a story I tell not very often. Um, I'm, I'm really good to my actors. I don't want anybody to think I'm a hard on actors, but this is a, <laughs> this is a good story. So... She, uh, Esther, she's in her 70s, and she's she's got this one scene to do. It's not that much lines. She's flubbing her lines, right? And then we're in the, we're, getting, we're on the fifth take, and she says, I can't do this. I got to go to the bathroom, right? I says, and I be like, Esther, you get this take right, you're going to go to the bathroom. You flub your line again, we're going to have a problem, and everybody going to know. <laughs> She got it on that tape. <laughs> See, those are the kind of stories I love. I love that kind of stuff. You can't get that anywhere else. You can't. This is great. Um, I was going to put that in my book. <laughs> you still can. You still can. You, sh you must, I think. Um, I want to ask you about two other love collaborators on That's that one. Um, John Williams for the score oh, and Wynton Marcellus. Yeah, oh, gosh, so could you yeah, talk was... about... Um, that process of creating the score was it different, and how did, had that was different from? Well, we we scored the movie before. We scored the movie with my friend Wynton Marsalis. Mm -hmm. So I I was went and scored the movie, um, and we, we you know we did it here at Lincoln Center, and and you know he he'd write the cues and he did you know he, you know Wynton is a genius. He's this he's this um, generation's Ellington. You know he can you know. He can play. He can write music. He can he can he can write different parts of different mu music for for any type of orchestra and give it to him stuff. And we did it, but it was too jazzy. Mm. It was it was really a cool score. And it's, when that score actually ended up later on. Kenny Burns, Ken Burns called me later on um, to use it for uh, a documentary about Jack Johnson, Unforgivable Blackness. Mm. And so Ken, Kenny Burns used it in, in his documentary later on, years after it was with. And I had to go to Winton and say, you know, after we had been up in Lincoln Center for nights and nights and nights working together and seeing him at the score, this doesn't work, man. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's too jazzy. It's, it's taken away from the motion. And I used a couple of cues. So then I call up Johnny Williams. We show Johnny Williams the picture at Warner Brothers. Johnny Williams watches it. And he says, well, I got to see if Steven's doing anything else and everything with this. And Steven wasn't doing it. He says, oh, John's my friend. Mm -hmm. So then I go and I'm working with John Williams. Like, I grew up, I grew up literally listening to John, certain cues, music cues from John Williams' music in high school. Like, I'd wake up and brush my teeth to the last cue of Star Wars where, you know, where Luke Skywalker um, and Han Solo they get their medals from Princess Leia, right? With the, you know... The, that opening, I would play and, and you know, my homework to keep me awake. I would play the truck cue from Where's of Our Lux Ark that would go, you know, it starts off in the movie. He says, you know, Sala says, you know, they board the Ark on a truck. And he says, what truck? And it goes, dun, 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 dun. So I know his music going all the way back to all the different pictures, right? We sit at, at his office in Amlin and he's at the piano and I said, okay, Johnny, you're a genius. You know, you've done these spectacular classic scores, but what do you know about the souls of black people? This is this is different. This is like you know, this is this is the heart. This is like you know, this goes all the way back to slavery, all the way through 
emancipation through you know pain and joy and everything. And he says, "Well, John, before I was a composer, I was an arranger. I hope I'm doing it right. And I arranged around six albums in the '60s for Mahalia Jackson. You ever heard of her?" <laughs> and I said, like, "Okay, I can't tell you shit." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so he goes and he starts playing and stuff with the piano because he tracks it on the piano and he does it there. And we have a, a spotting session with his music editor, I think his name's Kenny, and he's going over the movie and, he, and he's telling, he's giving copious notes of what he wants to do on every different thing in the movie. And he says, in, in this moment here, I want a nice Waxman pause here. And I said, does that refer to Franz Waxman, the composer? And he says, yes. He says, yes. And I'm like, wow, I'm like, I can't believe I'm fucking sitting with John Williams, like working on the score of my movie. I'm 27 years old. I'm like, I can't believe this shit, right? And he wrote an amazing, amazing score for that picture that that just gives the emotion of that, you know what I mean? And and choirs and mm. phenomenal. It was a phenomenal experience mm. working with him. I want to ask you about working with child actors, which happens in that movie. And some of your other ones as yes, well. And yes. especially how to direct younger actors when you're putting them in very intense situations, violence, right? Strong language. What kinds of guidance do you give them in those um, moments? It depends on the actors. I mean, some, some child actors were, are, are professional actors and some of them are just kids, you know. Um, um, <laughs> gosh. Um, the, some of them are nightmares and some of them are like just great because they're just kids and I think that what you want to do is just get them to just be kids the way that children would react in these situations um, on Boys in the Hood uh, most of the kids except for the little young Trey they were off really from the neighborhood um, the kid that played Doughboy um, in Boys in the Hood he's still a friend of mine his name is Beha Jackson he lived a block away from where we were shooting and so like you know when he was he was still in elementary school so and he was, became like my little brother and, you know, um, I was 22 when I did that, and I think he was like 10, 11. Mm -hmm. So he was just always under my arm and everything and stuff, right? Um, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna tell a story as a, I should tell a story about telling a story. So, because fine, it's just, it's just a boy thing. And I knew nothing about directing and everything. So, on Boys in the Hood, he has a scene where he, his brother gets the ball taken away from him. And, he, the guy takes the ball away from it and, and little door boy goes and confronts this older boy. And he says, hey, give me my brother's ball back. And he says, the guy says, what you, what you gonna do? What your fat ass gonna do? And then um, Beha, I had him kick the guy's legs. And the guy does a, a, a kind of a stunt smack in him. He falls down and he kicks him in the stomach. So then when he kicks him in the stomach, there's this close up of Beha's face, right? And Beha's gotta go, oh, like this, this, right? And so I am have the camera down there on the ground, and I say, okay, he's going to kick you. He's going to kick you in the stomach, and it's a, he kicks his stomach, and like, he goes like this. Ugh. And, you know, he's just not acting it right, right? And I said, okay, well, listen, you got to get this right with this. I said, get ready. He's going to kick you in the stomach, right, this, or this. And he's like, you ready? And I'm off camera. Now, mind you, me and this kid, I'm 22, okay? He's 11, but he's like my brother, okay? He's like my little brother now, right? He's always with me. I take him to see Dances with Wolves. I take the moves of this. So I'm off camera and he's going there and I punch him in the stomach. <laughs> and his fist goes, Ugh, listen to this. And he comes, he gets up. I said, okay, that's good. He gets up, he starts tearing up. I said, you did it, dude, you did it. You know, because we're like hard. You did it, you did it. He's like crying. Said, he's crying as if everybody's congratulating him. <laughs> but it's like, it's roughhousing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't, I've never done it to anybody else, but <laughs> the kid's is like my brother, you know what I mean? Like, you know, he's a chef now and everything and stuff. But yeah. we did the, when we did the 25th anniversary of Boys in the Hood in the park in LA, our acquisition park, we told that story to everybody in the park. They say, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you have to get children to be children, you know, and to be comfortable, you know, at being reacting in the way you can't over direct because what's indelible about children is just having them, having them basically, you know, reflect on this in a, a reality situation, not necessarily a, a creative reality situation, and that's what I think. You know, um, some kids I I try not to be chummy with. I like to just get a a natural reaction from them. 
you know, yeah. and just put them in the environment. And I really like, I like working with kids that aren't necessarily professional actors more than professional kid actors. That's just something about mm. about the way that they re respond to certain things and scenes that just for now, it just surprises me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really great. Yeah. Rosa was my kind of my zenith in the dramatic thing because I was like, I always wanted to be taken seriously as a director. And that was like the most serious thing that I could do, right? Because it was so serious that certain people were like, they could respect it, but they could respect it from afar. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have something like that come out now. And, like, and the studio shelved it. The studio was, was, did it have the impact that you wanted it to have? It didn't have the impact because, I mean, they would not even allow me to take it to the Baptist conventions. I said, you know, I could take this, this movie to all the ministers six months before it shows, and by the time it comes out, Everybody will know about it, and they wouldn't even because they were nervous about the content of it. They were like, you know, they were nervous. The student, um, Warner Brothers kind of shelved it. Um, it's not like Twelve Years a Slave or these other pictures coming out now, you know, like this. So, and it had a little bit of that stuff in it. So, but um, I didn't work for a period of time after that because mm -hmm. I was. It was like I'm the dramatic, serious message kind of guy. So I knew that I had to switch it up and do something, um, switch my career up as a director and. and and do do something that was more you know pop oriented or whatever right, and it's not that I looked down on action pictures because I grew up watching genre very genre films. Um, I love action pictures. I I love adventure movies actually. I call them adventure movies. I don't even call them action pictures. Action pictures denotes just straight gratuitous violence and just whatever. Like mm -hmm. an adventure movie is like Gunga Din. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know where characters going on 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 a, on a adventure in their change from the experience of it, right? Or Bridge on the River Kwai, yeah. you know, or Lawrence of Arabia, that's an adventure movie. Those are not action movies, right? And so those that that's what I kind of aspire to. And so um, I, I ended up getting the, the rights um, um, out of Warner Brothers, ironically, to do Shaft and uh, took it to MGM. MGM was going to make the movie because uh, uh, they made the original movie, but they lost the the, the rights to, to to do movies, and so MGM, but MGM couldn't afford to do the movie, so we got like maybe two million dollars in development or million five something like that in development, and I ended up calling up Paramount and I took it over to Paramount. They bailed me out from MGM, and we we made it at at, uh, at Paramount because they had a summer date. <laughs> they had a summer date, and they they, they needed, needed one other tent pole, and so we ended up making it there. And so it was my sh first straight action kind of play. Mm -hmm. What was your interaction like with Gordon Parks? Phenomenal. I mean, like, you know, um, I, I, I got a chance to spend time with Mr. Parks before I even made Shaft. And, um, you know, uh, he used to have an apartment over here near uh, the UN building and stuff. And uh, I'd go up and I'd sit up and talk to him and, you know, you know, we'd, we'd make dinner together. And, mm -hmm. um, and he was a kind of a consummate renaissance man. And the thing that he imparted to me as a, as a, as a young uh, filmmaker was, don't limit myself to film, you know, mm -hmm. really immerse myself in all the arts, you know, try music, yes. you know, try composing, uh, write some books, um, continue to take pictures and work on my photography. Um, and, um, and just really, really to be in his mode, kind of a cosmopolitan, you know, person to be a, 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 not necessarily a jack of all trades and master of none, but mm -hmm. someone who's open to, to various forms of creativity. And that's one thing that I really got from him is that he had a very, very full life because he was the kind of person who had very eclectic tastes and he could flow in different worlds. Gordon Parks was really, mainly, really the true shaft because mm -hmm. as you look at that picture, the original film, Shaft was just as a, much at home downtown as he was uptown, and that was Gordon Parks. And so, like, I mean, I, that's the way I, 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 you know, I look at things. It was like, a, and then there's very few people that can do that, that can traverse various worlds. And mm -hmm. so, um, that's what I learned from him. Describe your your directing style. Um, my directing style is is um, part a lot of pre planning. And, and, and thinking out stuff. But honestly speaking, a lot of it is improvisational um, because um, you can pre-plan as much as you want, but when you're on a set, 
you're dealing with actors and dealing with various elements, you have to be open to what's there in front of you and, 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 and move all these disparate parts towards, towards the end to tell the most cohesive, entertaining story as possible. Uh, see, some directors actually plan so much that there's so much in a box that they can't see it out of that box that they put it in, even when they're in reality. But you have to be able to take reality and put that reality into that box mm -hmm. and make that box a new reality, a new experience. And so I, I feel like, you know, some of the best stuff I do is really like thinking it, about it, reading the scenes over and over again, talking to the actors, talking to the various people about what it is, and then going on and making it what it has to be. Is there one example you can think of where you really felt that magic happening? It happens every day. It mm -hmm. happens whenever I'm working, it happens. It just, it's not one of that, but it happens every day when I'm on there. Because I, I, I you know, like, um, it's not hard anymore. It's like, you know, for me, it's like, it's like being, a, 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 a playing with, a, with, with uh, playing my instrument with, with some other people that, that, that actually play. You know, they say the old jazz musicians talk about they don't care who you are, where you're from, what race, what color, where you, what country you're from. If you can play, you can play, right? So it's like when I go on to something and I, I'm dealing with a new crew and everything like this, I'm playing. And my energy, I let my energy pervade on everyone else and they play. They play, they play maybe, be they play better than they do with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's that's where I started. I've started to look at it over the years. It's like, well, you know, okay, you know, we could do this in a different way, you know. Wow, I was going to ask how you have seen your directing style change over time. It sounds like part of that has to do not. Just I'm more confident. I'm yeah. more confident. I mean, like you know, I mean, I think Boys was a false confidence. Boys was like me, you know. Like I remember when I was on the set of Boys in the Hood. I said, okay, we're going to do this shot. It's going to be just like Scorsese would do. And this shot's gonna be like what Spielberg would do. And this is like, you know, this is from, you know, this is right from Truffaut. Truffaut did this shot in 400 blows. And I remember um, uh, the DP said, no, no, this is a John Singleton shot, you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? I didn't know anything back then, but that's good. You know, it's it's yeah. great to not know anything. It's like you know, I feel like I don't know anything now. I don't know anything mm -hmm. now until until the actors show show me what it is. Mm -hmm. Until you know, until I see things choreographed and and I see like you know and, and 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 see what the movement's going to be, and then I find out okay, maybe that's it. And I still don't know what it is until it's until we put it on there and I see it played back and cut together. I still don't know. There's a, there's an excitement in that. Mm. You know, I think a lot of filmmakers take out the spontaneity of, of what it is. I mean, we, we work and we're entrusted with millions of dollars of, of different things to, to apply our craft because, you know, if you get to a certain level, you have a track record where you're able to, to deliver. You know what I mean? There's only certain people that can actually deliver. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a want, there's more of a want of various people to deliver, but there's only certain people that can actually deliver on a on a consistent basis. And I like to be think of myself as being one of those types of people. Is that sense of improvisation part of what's exciting about working with first time actors? Like with Janet, with Tupac, with Ice Cube? Well, I mean, for me, back in the day, that was just because that's who I wanted to hang out with. I mean, that's the, the you know, people were in you know, I think I've put more musicians or hip hop musicians in, in pictures than they've had careers than anybody else. Is because um, you know, I mean, I'm I'm not a rapper. You know, I don't make music, but I like to. You know, most of the people I know then or whatever socialized with were in the music business. <laughs> You've made some cameo appearances in some of your films. Why do you do that? Uh, just a thing, the homage to what Hitchcock used to do. You know what I mean? Like you know. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock is one of my cinematic idols, and he did it in a, in a whimsical way in some of the pictures, and I, I like to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to ask you if your writing process has changed. You took us back to the days when you were on the floppy disk, right? Do you write stuff out? Do you, do you type I, I, stuff out? I write, I write longhand. I write, I write everything longhand first, and then I type it out. I feel like that the mind moves quicker than your hands on a keyboard can. So if you can, if you can write it out, you know, and, and you can change your idea, and you have it, you have it in your notebook, it's it's organic, it's there, you can touch it, you can feel it, you know. Um, 
when you get on a computer and you compose your ideas, you may second think yourself mm -hmm. and then delete it. And it may be something that you really, really had an inspired thought that is there and it's not, it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm kind of old fashioned where I think that people should write. They should write stuff out longhand. Um, it's, um, it's a matter of having like hundreds and hundreds of uh, thoughts and musings and, and ideas and um, notations on various pieces of paper where you can just look at it and, and have a reflection. And then when you know, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's just great. It's also great for archiving too, because you can look back and see, you can see in my notebooks where I came up with the idea for something that happens in any one of my other movies. Cause I, I, I learned how to do that in, in, in school. Mm. So you've kept your notebooks? All my notebooks. I have them all. <laughs> That's precious material. Yeah, yeah. My kids go and read them through and everything and stuff. I get pissed off and say, no, be careful with that shit. <laughs> Cause is it just ideas for films or does it combine other personal reflections? Ideas for reflections? films, personal reflections, ideas for films, different things, you know? Uh huh. What do you like about writing? Uh, that it's introspective. I like writing because it's introspective. It's um, it's a it's a kind of a kind of a, a serendipity kind of thing where you're like you're really in a place that no one else can be but you at that time, and then it's your decision to share with the world if you want to or not. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I like about mm -hmm. writing things longhand on, on pieces of mm -hmm, paper. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a different sense of what your approach is to writing for film versus television? Not at all, not at all. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's very much the same thing, mm -hmm. very much the same thing. Even though the structures are kind of different. Even though the structures are kind of different, even though, because television is becoming, it's, they're, they're all merging now. There was a time where television was mostly just really verbiage. Yeah. And it was like, trying to put words in people's mouths, even if they you know, there's nothing had to be there. Now, television, you know, you have huge swaths of time where characters don't have to necessarily say anything, where everything, is, where the visual storytelling is being told with the sparse dialogue. And it's beautiful because it's more cinematic. Everyone's watching television now on, on, on these huge flat screens that are, that are built like like movie screens, and they're watching them in a kind of a cinematic thing. There's, there's no four by three kind of thing anymore with that boxing mm -hmm. thing. You don't have to frame for that anymore. We frame now for, you know, in a kind of aspect ratio that was made for film mm -hmm. for TV as well. And so that's what really excites me about it because there's, the medium is, is um, the medium has changed. It has, it's changed. Do you feel it's become more cinematic? I think I think so. It's becoming much more cinematic. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference for one or the other? Um, I don't. I mean, I, I like TV now because it's, it's like ma I can make a movie every other week, you know, and I can I can I can I can I can play with things, you know. I can, I can you know. It's like it's like would you ask somebody, you know, like you know, you know, do you like going to play at this playground that you can go to, you know, every other day, and there's some new toys and there's new people to play with. And there's, you can socialize with some new people, and every other day they're going to have a new apparatus that you can use. Or you go over here to, to this place that maybe every few few times you can go play with it, and maybe you won't have everything that you want. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, that's what it is, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You've talked about hip hop already, but I wonder if you could say more about how hip hop has impacted your artistry. Um, just in the fact that um, it's, it's, it's the. It's not necessarily the music as much as it is the culture and and everything around my generation that grew up from the the, the early seventies, early late seventies to through the eighties, where hip hop was evolving and changing and and, and coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, I just, we just have a, a a different sensibility towards the world and towards storytelling in terms of. Um, the possibilities in it, and um, I think we have a, a measure of an ownership of pop culture, mm -hmm. um, and that we're, we're kind of exposed to various forms of, of 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 pop culture, and you know, and we were responsible for changing it yeah. in a way. Yeah. You know, if there wasn't hip hop music, you know, there'd be no President Obama. You know, so it's like. Um, 
we, we've bridged a lot of gaps in the world through the propagation of, 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 of black culture into pop culture. Black culture has always, has always been pop culture. You go back to whether or not you want to, you know, you know, degrade, you know, the menstrual culture and everything and stuff. And all that. That, was a, that was a big thing in the 20s and stuff when the jazz age was fueled by black music. You know, you know rock and roll was fueled by blues and then R&B. So it's like, so, so black, pop, black culture has always been the undercurrent and the kind of the sediment and the root of all American pop culture. So if you look at hip hop, you know, it's just an extension of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I'm the first generation uh, kind of like hip hop filmmaker, you know, to come out and do that. It has nothing to do with music. Like Poison Hood, Poison Hood is a hip hop movie. It's not, it doesn't have people rapping on the corner and it's, it's not like Elvis Presley, like, you know, you know, you know, what's that movie? Um, Jail, uh, Jailhouse Rock. Rock, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like that, you know, but it's, it's a hip hop movie and the sensibility and the culture. It's, it's why the, it's why the people are making the music is what it's in the movie, you know? That's fantastic. Cause yes, people talk about it in terms of putting hip hop artists in the films, putting hip hop music in the films, but it's not the culture. way, yeah. It's all about culture. Yeah. So then let's talk about use of hip hop music in the films and, mm -hmm. and how you imagine how you have used that music alongside other kinds of music, how you approach the soundtracks. I use music in various ways. I mean, I like, I like to have uh, stuff uh, more source than score, mm -hmm. you know, especially when I use uh, pop music. I like my pop, pop music to be sourcey coming from different places, you know, whether or not they come from a stereo for cars. Um, that comes from me when I went to USC. I had to take sound twice at USC. I took it when my, when my uh, I think my second semester of my sophomore year, because I was pledging a fraternity, which was hard. <laughs> no, and that, no, that's first semester of sophomore year. And then, um, and also because in sound at USC, they don't teach you just about sound. They teach you about the psychoacoustics of sounds, the physics of sound. They teach you about, you know, how sound propagates within air and within water, within, within solid objects. <clears throat> they teach you about room reverberation time and, and different technical terms like songs and fonts and all this stuff. And I'm like, why the fuck do I need to know this to make movies, right? And so I didn't take it seriously. And so, um, I, you know, I didn't get that good. The class is divided between camera and sound, and I got a bad grade in sound, but a good grade in camera, so it pulled my whole grade down. But then I took the class again in the second semester of my senior year, and I had to take it to graduate to get a good grade. And, and as I took it in the second semester of my senior year, that summer I made Boys in the Hood. And so I directed not only the picture and the environment, but I also, when I'm in the, in the moment of the set, I'm directing the sound too. I'm having people react to the helicopter sounds that aren't there. I'm having people react to sounds that I know I'm gonna put in the background. I created, I created me, tap on the shoulder, I created the sound design for Urban America with Boys in the Hood that people used in umpteen movies of since. You know, mm -hmm. and um, I've changed up since then. You know what I mean? But I'm saying like, like, but that comes from 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 what they taught us at USC about sitting in an environment and listening to the different levels and listening to what's there, and trying to find a way to which to use the sound to to support the themes of whatever story that you're telling. You know, you know, it's not just about being loud. Mm -hmm. It's about what you're putting in there, and about the different levels, and about the there's a rhythm to it, you know. And, and you know, there may be stuff that is, it's there, it's more felt than heard. It's there if you really listen to it. It's there, you can hear it, but it should be more felt than heard. And that's stuff that I work on with every project, whether it's TV or film, film or TV. I'm always trying to find a way to, to elevate, those other elements, you know, mm -hmm. within sound. Mm -hmm. That's amazing yeah. because it really does capture. That's like the psychology of living in that environment. Yeah, there's a, a there's, a, there's a moment in Boys in the Hood where one of the best moments I feel I did in terms of directing the sound was uh, when Ricky gets shot as uh, the camera's over cranking in slow mo and he's running. You can hear these children in the neck in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the um, thing in the fence over laughing and they're playing. Okay, and then he gets shot and the sound drops off. 
the same sh children that were laughing and playing while he was running, you hear them crying, you hear a baby crying in the background. You know, I dropped out the silence mm -hmm. for a second when he gets shot and you can really hear the pfft. You don't even hear an exit wound. You don't hear, a, you know, that was there, but took that out. You, 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 Cause you could have tried to be more violent, but you hear pfft. You know what I mean? Like, and you don't, you know, and it drops out and it's silent and um, Trey is running towards him, it's silent. The car, is, Doughboy's car is driving fast and then it's silent, but then you, you raise it up as it's coming up as it, you're not in reality. Mm -hmm. You are in reality, but you're not in reality, you know? And so that's, that's, that's picture and sound working in, in a kind of a different way together. Right. Yeah. And I actually did that, uh, you know, I called back to that in um, this television uh, show that I've just done called Rebel. I have a scene like that and I, I play with that. It's funny because I was like, wow, I'm lamping myself. I'm like, I'm old enough to steal from myself now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, you went so deep right there. I feel mm -hmm. kind of superficial going back to a music question. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to ask you about working with Stanley Clark. and about Oh, Stanley, yeah, Stanley. Um, I met Stanley on this, you know, Saul show again um, because uh, he was doing a thing with Gregory Hines, and Gregory Hines, who was the coolest man ever, Gregory Hines did a thing for Arsenio where he had like a, a tap board, which was lit up, and and of course it had sand on it, and he would, he would tap, and as he would tap, Stanley would play along with Gregory dancing. And I remember watching the rehearsal as an intern, and talking to Gregory, who was nice, nice, nice to me, nice to me then, talking to Stanley who was nice to me. So then a year later, I need a composer for my thing, and I was like, I called up Stanley's agent, and he said, oh, you know, this is, uh, we met before, yes, yeah, you did this, and you were, you were cool with me. He says, wow, he says, I'm happy I was nice to you. <laughs> and we ended up doing three movies together, you know? <laughs> and that work relationship? What did yes. You say? How, how, how did that? It was great, it was that? great. I was, Cause I'm, you know, I, I'm a frustrated musician myself. I just love to sit up with people who really know their stuff and just, and, 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 and just glean some knowledge from them. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you about Ruth Carter, who you've worked oh, with. Oh, Ruth, yeah. Um, both yeah, Ruth. on contemporary and more historical kinds of projects. Yeah, Ruthie, damn, how many movies have I done with Ruthie now? I've done um, Rosewood, Baby Boy, Shaft, um, Four Brothers. Um, yeah, I've done five movies with Ruthie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> What's it like working with her? She's phenomenal, man. She's the best in the business. Um, two Academy Award nominations and, you know, um, she just really, really gets how the costumes really uh, change and, and support the thematic of whatever story. I think it, like, it was Ruthie and me that gave Sam Jackson the look that he got for Shaft. Like, you know, um, it, because before Shaft, nobody thought Sam Jackson was sexy. We gave him, <laughs> we gave him the goatee, we gave him the clothes, the clothes. And sent there like it was a new dude, like, and he went on and did like forty movies with that look. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, yeah, that was Ruth Carter. Wow, and me, our collaboration. Wow. <laughs> how would you say that? Um, well, you've already kind of said this, but I want to hear you say more about how real world events impact your work. And I guess I'm thinking back to something like Poetic Justice, where two weeks into shooting the film, the Rodney King verdict comes out and you have this period of writing. Well, we, we were the first, we were the only movie that didn't stop filming um, mm -hmm. when that happened, when, when the LA uh, riots happened. We, we were up in actually Simi Valley. We were, um, that's how I ended up at the courthouse uh, that day because I was on my way to Simi Valley to shoot Poetic Justice anyway. Um, and so um, I just stopped off and, and um, tried to confront the, the cops that were just uh, exonerated for, for Bidding and lynching Rodney King, and so um, I mean, hey, you know, and then we ended up shooting some of the footage uh, and putting it in the picture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm also thinking about something like the death of your friend Tupac Shakur, right? And the way that kind of the art and life ironies sometimes can impact an artist's work. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, after Tupac died, it was a uh, as a, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's, it's funny because 
we had a professional relationship and everything. We also had a personal relationship. He was he wouldn't allow anybody to get too close to him, but he wouldn't allow anybody to get too far from him if he really cared about you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and um, he was the loss of him was like it's like imagine if if Scorsese lost Robert De Niro. That was what it was for me because we were like I look at Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. They grew up and, and they broke up in and around Little Italy. You know, they were contemporaries. They knew each other from afar as kids. And they weren't really close, but they, they started a professional careers, you know, in a similar time, and then they started doing process data, and they were collaborators. So that's what I lost when Tupac was, mm. was, was murdered. Mm. Like, I lost someone who was from my generation who was serious about what, it, what about his art, you know, and what he did, and a collaborator, you know. And I, I don't think I've ever recovered. I don't think I've ever gotten somebody like that since. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't. Um, does the project Baby Boy in some ways reflect some of your thinking about Tupac, your relationship with him? Um, the Baby Boy doesn't reflect my relationship with Tupac. It was a, it was a movie that I developed for him. Uh-huh. It was a movie that I developed that I was going to do with him. Um, and the last time when we spoke, it was at the Crenshaw Mall, and I said, I got the movie that's going to get you an Oscar nomination. This is like, this, this, and we were supposed to have a meeting and lunch, and uh, within a week, he was gone. Um, and I put it on the shelf and hadn't really thought about it, you know, until uh, uh, just before I did Shaft and then I uh, met Tyrese and I was like, okay, well, you know, you know, he's from Watts, you know, he's a kid, he could probably do this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I met Taraji at the time too and stuff and everything. And, and um, then I went off to do Shaft and I came back to Baby Boy. I came from. I was in New York for like a year, and then I went back to LA. So I gotta do something LA. I get in these LA moves. Like I gotta do LA, right? Went back to South Central Los Angeles, and I just went back in the neighborhood and did a you know what I wanted to do, like you know a truly LA movie that some people, you know, I mean some people remember me or love that movie, you know, as much as they love Boys in the Hood because it's like it's so indelible to what that experience is and so specific to what that experience is. is. And um, I did the same thing I did on Boys in the Hood, even more so, you know, not just with a pretty much predominantly black crew, but, you know, I had every, you know, every gang member, every mm-hmm. everybody, you know, every, friends, families, my own children in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it a really personal, personal kind of thing. You know, my mama's in a scene. <laughs> so I was like, you know, it's trying to like, really like, make the, make it part and parcel of, of me, you know. Um, and it was a very fun film. Um, um, I think uh, it reminds me of those those films that they used to make uh, in the Italian neorealist realist tradition, where they they would make these films that were very real, but they'd have these surreal elements in them, you know. With um, I think it was uh, Rossellini and Cesar Zavattini. And um, and um, who was that did that miracle in Milan? Was it Zavatini? Um, where they like you know you'd have these environments where they were like really really reality based, but there would be these interesting different cinematic things that only could happen in a movie mm. would happen with these people in mm-hmm. it, and that's what I was really going for with Baby Boy, mm. you know, and at the same time having this dysfunctional relationship, dysfunctional romantic relationship that a lot of people uh, uh, at a certain age were playing out. Um, you know, young black men and, and women and trying to find a way in which to, you know, because the movie really is about the black family without being married. You know, it's like, you know, they come together and, you know, and realize they, they can't be apart, you know, no matter how dysfunctional and crazy it is, that, they can, that they're better off together than apart. Mm-hmm. And, um, we had a lot of fun making that movie. We, really, it was a lot of laughs, and um, everybody was new. I mean, like you know, Bing Rams was the, the veteran on, on that. You know, he came back to play. You know, he. he uh, that's another thing of like making Bing badass. <laughs> so no, as people would forget, <laughs> Pulp Fiction. <laughs> How did you come up with the opening, the in utero? Opening and uh, both, both conceptually, but then executing it. Um, well, the whole thing, the whole idea was it was um, 
there was a, 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 a psychologist name was her name was Dr. Frances Quest Welsing, and uh, I think she was out of DC. She used to be on Donahue and those different things in the '80s, and she used to talk about melanin jealousy. And there was, a, you know, she's this black woman on TV talking about, and she's in, within an all white environment, and she's saying, "Well, she's like, white people are jealous of black people." And they're like, "Why would we be jealous? Well, you guys all tan. This, listen, you know, you know, you know, if a, if, if a black man has a baby with a white woman, they're black, and if a black woman, a white black woman has a baby with her, they're black. So." You know, there's a lot of black people in the world. There's more people with color in the world. You know, so you're all jealous. You're all scared. And people, and they, she'd be on Donahue, and everybody's like, "You're crazy!" And she was literally, with her words, she was scaring the audience. <laughs> and so there's this, there's this, there's, there's these subsets of, of black people within the arts community and all that stuff that love to listen to her tapes. They love to listen to, they love to, to hear her speak and everything. Like this, you know. You know, you know, they always have, and every summer, I don't know why they just have them in the summers. They have these African market fests and everything and stuff, right? And they, and you know, you know, everybody got the dashikis and they got this and this and this chic and people eat, 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 you know, they, they eat the summer food and stuff like this. And they always have her stuff there, right? And I was like, um, I heard her do this thing about this analogy talking about, the, you know, the black man in America as a baby a not yet fully formed being that has yet to realize its full potential to support, you know, and she says, what does he call it? And she, and she, tells, she goes, she goes, what does he call his, his woman, mama? What does he call his girl, baby? And what does he call his place of residence, the crib? And she's basically, she's a hip hop artist. She was 60 something years old, but she's a hip hop, she's rapping this shit, right? And she just dropping factoids or whatever, you know what I mean? Some of it's all base, but some of it's right on point, right? So I was like, what if I visualize this for an audience? So I was like, okay, let me take this guy and put him as a grown man in a womb. And so we, we, we as I, I had the idea, I storyboarded it and stuff. We did it in a swimming pool. We, we, made, this, we made the thing, I, I don't know, I don't, it wasn't Stan Winston's people, it was somebody else, some model shop did it. They made a, a womb for us. It was like fiberglass and all this stuff. They even made a kind of a um, umbilical cord that pumped and everything and stuff, and we put it in, and then, and Tyrese's first day on the set, he had to go down into a swimming pool, and he had to hold his breath and act like he was a baby, and it was like, and we just pull the camera back underwater, and it's like, it's perfect, man. It's like, I'm really proud of that image because it's like, it just, it's really freaky, you know what I mean? It's like, yo, I've never seen that before. It's like one of those things that, um, that you want to, you want to set off a movie with a, a great defining opening image. The defining opening image is what the, the movie thematically should be about. Mm. And it's really pushing these boundaries in terms of like that realism, surrealism thing you were talking about. Yeah, before. yeah, you know, just really like, you know, no one wants to see a damn documentary, but you want to see something with some kind of uh, weight to it, story-wise, culture-wise, and then you want to see something that's hip. And the movie is a hip movie. I mean, people still watch it nowadays. It's watching in a loop and everything. It's because they're like, you know, it's, as I, the, I always say kind of like the hardest thing to do is to shock black people because our experience in this country is just so damn shocking anyway, right? But to do it in a story thing, like, you know, shock. I made that movie to, to make comment about certain things that I had issue with and people will laugh at the stuff. Cause they're, but they're also laughing very uncomfortably because it's like, oh my God, I know someone like this or oh my God, I'm like this or oh my God, like I'm living this experience. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that recognition. Yeah, 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 exactly. Did you think of that as part of a trilogy? Were you thinking of this because it's been described in terms of people? Yeah, looking well, at that was kind of like my, what I called my hood trilogy, that mm -hmm. Point of Justice, Boys in the Hood, Point of Justice and Boys in the Hood. But um, I, I, I look at it now as like, you know, like it's uh, kind of like part of my, my experience, my personal experience and, um, you know, uh, of, of growing up a certain way and being able to dramatize that. Mm -hmm. Like I have a new show that's going to be on FX called Snowfall, which parts of it happened in LA in the early 80s, well, before Boys of the Hood, in 1983. You know what I mean? And it's um, how cocaine changed mm -hmm. LA. Mm -hmm. It's before crack. And you mm -hmm. see, you know, how when that comes in, it changes. But it's South Central, it's the San Fernando Valley, and it's East LA. You know, so it's like it's you see how Los Angeles is evolving and changing because of the proliferation of cocaine, not crack, yeah. cocaine. Yeah. You know, with 
the CIA basically um, facilitating a drug pipeline into the West. Mm. So. Mm. Wow. And, um, and it's hip and cool in time. <laughs> <laughs> hip and cool has to be. <laughs> um, the cool music. All that 80s music. You know. <laughs> That's really good music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I should have asked you when you were talking about the opening of Baby Boy, like how you think about the openings of your films more generally, where you are making that first I said it. statement. I said it, though. Yeah, it's but for other much. films, you know. I mean, I, I always try to think about what's the defining image of, uh, of uh, 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 the first image of the film and how it thematically can impinge on the rest of the film. I mean, the, the opening of Boys in Hood is a stop sign, you know. I mean, you know, and you move it to a stop sign where the 747 is going overhead and blurring out a sound, you know? Yep, yeah. What about Too Fast, Too Furious? Too Fast, I think Too Fast, Too Furious, it's, it's a, a truck pulling up, you know what I mean? And then I guess a, a sexy girl puts in like kind of a, a, a sign that like blocks the street off. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? So not exactly the same kind of impact that you were going for just with some different. of the other stuff? Just different. Yeah, just different. So let's talk about some of those films. I'm thinking about Too Fast, Too Furious, mm -hmm. Four Brothers, mm -hmm. Abduction, Illegal mm -hmm. Tender, some of the um, action, mm -hmm. more action-oriented films. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk a bit about working with Tyrese Gibson and how uh, that relationship has developed. Well, yeah, I got Fast and Furious because Universal, Stacey Snyder, who was one of Universal, she, uh, whenever anybody, you know, they had this thing called the, the bailout circuit where you have to, you get a print of the picture and you can show it in your home and all that stuff. Well, I had an office in South Central <laughs> and that was like my projection facility was in South Central. So I would get Spider-Man, I'd get all these different movies and I, from studio and stuff. And I was like, anybody wants to print, print of my movie, they got to call me directly and ask me for it. So Stacy wanted to see Baby Boy. So she sees Baby Boy. The weekend it comes out, she gets a print. Ving Rams is giving the studio, a head, I mean, um, um, What's name? Vin Diesel is going to studio hell because they want to make the sequel to Fast and Furious, the first one. He wants twenty million dollars. They're like, we're not giving you twenty million dollars. I mean, they're paying him twice as much now. But <laughs> and so she sees it. She says, so she dispatches Scott Stuber to call me and ask me about Tyrese. And I said, you know, if he's funny. He's as funny as Eddie Murphy was when he was young. He's like, he's he's charismatic and everything. He says, and then it says, oh, we're thinking about him for. You think he could replace Vin, Vin Diesel? I said, yeah, he could. He's like, you know, you get a whole different thing for the audience. So they go and explore casting. This is all within a week. They go and explore casting Tyrese and Fast and Furious. And then they said, you know, um, if he doesn't, you know, would you consider directing it? And I said, oh, yeah. I mean, because for me, the first movie was kind of a joke. And like, I had referenced the real shit, excuse me, in Boys and Hood, the street races on Florence. The street races on Florence. Mm -hmm. You know, who lives in the hottest girls? The street races on Florence. We, that was, Real for us, right? And so um, I go in, I, they called me into a meeting and um, I watched the, the movie, the, the first movie, and they called me into a meeting with Stacey Snyder and all the, and, um, all the Universal Brass. And I tell them, hey, you know, this is real for me. I, I know this world, <clears throat> this is what I would do. I give them like three or four defining images that I would do, you know, a car jumping over another car over a bridge, um, Paul, making Paul Walker a uh, more edgy character, um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a uh, a rogue dude, not a cop anymore because he's so good looking and not, you know, you want to make mm -hmm. him dirty him up and make him more Steve McQueen, uh, you know what I mean? And, and so, uh, and, I, and I have him like do this thing called a Rockford 180 where he can slide, he can drift the car and it go up and he'd smile right to the camera and, and actually be very judicious about when he would smile so he'd be more edgy, right? And they just took my notes and said, okay, well, fine, a little bit of this. And I walk out of this office and they said, no, no, we got another meeting for you to go to. And I go on this other meeting. I said, you got another meeting. So I go on this other meeting and I walk into the meeting and it's a production meeting. I said, okay, well, we got the director. Let's, we got about, we got what, uh, four months before shooting. And I, I got the job and I didn't even know I had the job. <laughs> I like, they just, I mean, I, they needed a director. And we had no script and... I took the writers to the Lowell's of Santa Monica because they were going to fire them. I said, no, we're going to work this shit out within three days. And we, we actually hammered out a script, you know, and made it better so that the, the um, you know, they always have these, they have action set pieces and then they have these informational scenes that are just filler for the set pieces. Well, I always feel in an action film, 
the informational scenes and the filler scenes have to be as entertaining as the set pieces. Otherwise, the audience is going like this. When the set piece comes, they go, and then when people start talking, they go, they should go the whole time, <laughs> you know? And so we, they sent us down to, to Miami uh, for about eight months, and, you know, we had fun, <laughs> me and Paul and, uh, Paul and um, Tyrese, and um, I got them together. They bonded really tight, and um, I called my friend Cole Hauser, who was in a higher learning. He's in it, and, um, you know, Ludacris. I got Ludacris to do the picture. Uh, which was we formed a great relationship off of that, um, breaking another rapper. <laughs> and um, I mean, yeah, hey, like I said, we were in Miami for eight months. We had, we had a blast. <laughs> I still have a place down there because of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, crew members do you collaborate with the closest when you're putting together action sequences? Like, how does that work? Uh, always my always my DP and, and, and my camera operators. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, the DP and the camera. I'm always with the DP and the camera. I'm not one of those um, sit on their butts um, directors behind a chair and a monitor. I'm always right next to the camera. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm right next to the camera and I'm officiating because you want to be close to the action. You want to be close to the camera and you want to be close to the actors. You want to be able to just, you know, if you got to touch the actor, you're right there. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that that gives people when they give them their performances because it's our job to really help guide those performances. And even if, even if the actor, even if a lot of, like a lot of actors, at least in this generation, depends on where they are, if they're from theater or they're from just movies and TV, it, it doesn't matter what, if they have, a, a, what kind of personalities they have, if they're cantankerous or if they're moody or if they're an actress that has personal problems, whatever, they, they all want to be guided. Hmm. You know, that's something I learned a very long ago. They all, they all want guidance. They want to know that they're in good hands, that they're working with someone that they trust, that really, um, for the experience of working with them, that they're not going to lead them astray because it's their careers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if you can give them that in a way that's um, very organic and they feel very comfortable with you, they'll do anything for you. And, and um I mean, I found that out over the years, and, and that's what that's kind of like what I try to, uh, the energy that I try to give off whenever I'm working on anything. Mm, that's a really powerful insight. Yes. How are those the days when you're doing the kind of set pieces on the set? How, do those feel different from the days when you're doing, you know, more yeah, talky oriented it's stuff? It's different. It's totally, different, totally different. The, the talking head scenes are totally different from set pieces. Set pieces are like, you know, you 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 have all these disparate elements, and there's just more people involved. Whether or not it's, you know, effects driven or mechanical effects or, mm -hmm. or, you know, anything, yeah. you know, certain things in terms of the way the 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 the, um, the, the sets are built and everything. Like this is like totally different, totally different. Do you feel more pressure during those days? Are there, because they're more expensive days, right? Or they are no, there I mean, fewer. Uh, the more people, you can the more do? people involved, the more zen like I have to be because everyone's mm -hmm. gauging off of the way that I'm. Mm -hmm. Acting. So it's like the more, the more, the more pressure there is, the more cool I have to be, and the more I have to get people to to work fast, but also be very, very loose and you know and judicious about things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's talk about your work as a producer and working mm -hmm. with other directors. Mm -hmm. um, how you make decisions about those kinds of projects, what your involvement will be. I do. I mean, as a producer, I do stuff that I that I that I would want to direct, but I don't have time to direct. But that I, you know that that holds my interest. I mean, um, my first project as a producer was a, a really hustle and flow, mm -hmm. where I used my own money uh, to do it because I, I I figured you know God you know if I could if I could have done Boys in the Hood on my own where would I be you know um, uh, this uh, you know, young man Craig Brewer who I met through Stephanie Elaine who mm -hmm. discovered me off of Boys in the Hood. Uh, he wrote a great script, and he had done several different phenomenal short films, including a small independent feature uh, that I really loved. And he shot it himself. He, he he was DP on it. He wrote it, directed. He put a, a lot of his family in it. It was very personal. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, this guy can direct a movie. And so um, I, I set about collaborating with him, and um, you know. Uh, Finding, you know, he 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 uh, he always wanted Terrence Howard for for the lead in that part, 
Um, I was dubious at first because Terrence had a kind of questionable career as an actor and not been too reliable. And I had to go spend some time with Terrence and, you know, get kind of Hoover Crip on him and tell him, I'm putting five million dollars of my money on this damn thing, motherfucker. <laughs> it's like, listen, you, I told him, I said, listen, if, if you fuck off my money, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you, <laughs> but if you listen to me and we work together, I'll change. I promise you, I'll change your life. True story. And of course, you know, when we got Taraji, who had been a baby boy, and um, you know, in it, and and it was good. And then after we did Hustle and Flow, <clears throat> um, we, we, were, we were like this. It was like summer stock. We did Hustle and Flow in summer of 2004, and then the fall of 2004. Um, I took Terrence and Taraji and put them in Four Brothers because I couldn't pay them. Nothing. I didn't have no money to pay them. So then I put them in, the, in a big movie, got them some money, mm. and we just went from one movie wow. to the next, you know? Wow. <laughs> what are some of the differences? I mean, budget, obviously, but mm -hmm. between working on independent films and working on something that has a studio back Well, in. independent films are like, they're, they're, it's just, it's a difference between, you know, uh, baking bread and like this oven that's like a, a classic oven like you know that your grandmother cooked in and and then you know making like five loaves and like you know uh, industrial oven that has the same ingredients mm -hmm. and, you know whatever so that's what I think <laughs> I got you like artisanal <laughs> yes. that's the word they use in exactly. these days right yes at the end of some of the films that you've made you have a line it's kind of about the new the new hand dealing the new um, yeah, that's that's. What is that about? That's my immature self putting in what stuff that I had when I when I was in film film school. That's me trying to like you know, when I was a kid, like I don't have a pot to piss in, and I'm gonna go into business and change the business and watch out, motherfuckers, because you know <laughs> I'm gonna show you guys some different. And my company's called New Deal Productions, and dealing a new hand, you know, what I mean mm -hmm. South Central Cinema, I don't like that. All right. Just goes back, you know. That's when I had a chip on my shoulder. I don't, I don't, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. Anymore. I'm much more relaxed. <laughs> I kind of, kind of did what I said I was going to do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so now you can mellow out. <laughs> yeah, mellow out yes. <laughs> All right, you were talking about Taraji. So, can we talk about Empire? Oh yeah, yeah, Empire, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And the episode you directed for, and how that came about. You're directing. Well, Empire came about. Well, first of all, Taraji told me she was working on it. Um, she was, they were developing it and everything, and and um. And, um she uh, said Lee had the show and they started doing it. And then um, Lee called me up. I was on my boat relaxing and he was like, I'm doing this. You know, Lee's real high strung. He talks with his hands and everything. He's like, he's like, I'm doing this show and, you know, I'm supposed to do another episode, but I, I can't do this episode. You should come out and do this episode. And I said, well, show me the pilot. So he sent me the pilot. I love the pilot. Um, I love what he did. Cause, and, 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 and to Lee's credit, um, the show initially was like his own personal journey. And so I really got into that. He's showing a side of himself, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, he, I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, here's a script and everything like this. And I said, can I, can I mess around with this and work with the writer who's a friend of mine, Malcolm Spelman, make it better? He said, whatever you want to do, I just want you to go there and I want you to go kick their asses, show them what this fucking show is. And I said, well, motherfucker, you, you, you took my two actors that made the damn show. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what the fucking show is. Like, well, go show those motherfuckers. Go kick their asses. So I, I said, okay, I got to get into television in some kind of way. You know what I mean? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I hadn't really, I mean, I'd been offered, I'd been offered so many different things in television for so many years. I mean, I can't believe the things I turned down. Like, I, mean, I must have lost the fortune turning down stuff on TV. I'm like, I could have done The Wire, you know, you know, we're working on The Wire, Criminal Minds, you know what I mean? Like, all these different shows over the years. Because I was, I was just... Wisconsin in film. Hmm. It was just that that you thought the film was a more well. I just thought film medium? was my my medium, and I just I, I knew I thought there was more hands in television, hmm. watering it down, watering down, not wanting to have have potent stories and everything. But that evolved and changed because they're in a competition for eyes. So you know when you're in a competition for eyes, you want to have the strongest stories possible, the strongest impact possible so even if you do have more 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 people you know, going over the stuff so anyway so I said okay this would be a nice entry easy I'm working with two people I know 
So I ended up going to uh, Chicago and working at Empire and just sat about trying to like put my personal stamp on this episode. And so, uh, and I did. I mean, like, you know, everyone loved what I did. Yeah. And uh, I said, you know, I know what the show is. This was a show I told you. you they said, our show is this. I said, I said, you guys don't know what this fucking show is. I was like, so why would I do that? I said, the show is this. I said, you have to have these these interesting dramatizations happen and there's tension, there's romance and all this stuff. And then the tension becomes released by the music. The music is not a set piece. It, it, the, it, when the music comes, it's like, ah, but you're not waiting for the music. It has to be an organic one. But since they've done all these other different things, but, but that's what was my thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, Lee wanted me to work on the show more over from various seasons, but I was like, I'm trying to build my own TV business. I'm trying to, you know, so I ended up um, selling a show uh, that I created to, uh, to, to FX mm -hmm. called Snowfall. And um, it's about cocaine in the early 80s and how it changed Los Angeles mm -hmm. and eventually the world. And uh, it happens and starts in 1983. It's wow. cocaine, not crack. And so the Snowfall is when the prices of cocaine come down and every, this, everyone has access to this thing and how it evolved and changed into the crack epidemic. Wow. So that's what the snowfall wow. is. So Empire, what that was your first TV directing em experience? Empire was my first TV directing experience, and The People vs. O.J. Simpson was my second uh, TV mm -hmm. directing experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much prep time did you have? It sounds like not very much for the oh, Empire. When, you, when you're prepping these things, you have probably between, between sometimes between four and ten days to prep. It's like, you know, but it's great, though. It's like... I, I look at TV directing as like it's CrossFit for, for directors. It's like, you know, you got to be able to like move really fastly, fast at an elevated quality level and, and just deliver. And some people either do that or they just direct traffic and they just do a oh, single and stand here and talk and do this over shoulder this. I don't do that. I'm like a, you know, I try to be like, like I said before, I'm there to play. I'm there to, to be like, John Coltrane. I'm there to like, you know, be like Bird. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm, this is your show, this is your vision, but John Singleton's coming to show you what it could be. So, and like, that's the fun of it. Like, when I come in and do something like that. So that's that's kind of when I approach doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want to go in and flip it in a different way that only I can flip it in. Yeah, really and bring I, your chops to it. Yeah, bring, bring my chops to it. Yeah. Uh huh. And have fun. And have fun. You know, what I mean, just bring my energy to whatever else anybody's trying to do. That's mm -hmm. what I try to do. Mm -hmm. How involved are you in post-production for that episode or for other TV work that you've done? Post I mean, you know, you, you get a little bit of time to cut it. Mm -hmm. um, um, the cool thing about doing TV also is that it, it, I'm able to play, I'm able to play like William Wyler, like John Ford, like Michael Curtis, like the directors, uh, the prominent directors of the late 30s, early 40s were when they would they worked for various studios and they weren't allowed to cut their, their movies. But they shot their movies the way they wanted them to be cut. So that's what I do on TV. It's shot exactly the way I wanted to be edited. So you have very few choices. But they let me do that. Like certain journeymen, TV directors don't want to do that. They're like, well, give us more stuff. Because I'm doing exactly what's in the service of the story and I'm elevating what's in the, in, in the story. So it's like, it's like, it's, it's for me, it's like I'm, I'm able to play that, you know, and, and, it's, and it's allowing me to, to do um, what those directors that I really admire of, of the golden age of film did. They, they did umpteen movies a year yeah. because they were able to go from one set to the next, you know, you know, and do a Western, do a drama, do a comedy. But there was a personal stamp to each one of them. You could feel their personal stamp on everything they did. And that's me playing in the television field. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. it's, it's working. Mm -hmm. It's great. Because what you're describing in my nerdy film studies world, right, that's what makes the auteur. Because yeah. you're well, in no, this kind well, of well, factory environment, well, but you find a way for your own voice to come well, through. Well, try to find some tip. You know, auteur is like authorship. Like, you know, like, you know, yes, it's written by someone else and everything, but you try to find a way to, to make that vision as specific as possible to you. You know, regardless of what it, whatever it is, and that's what you know. That's all what any 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 artist worth their salt wants to do. You don't want to homogenize whatever you're doing. You want it to be specific to 
personal expression because in this whole thing, I mean, there's everybody has a need, a need to be to be heard, to be seen, to uh, to say, you know, like in in this small particular time in which we're here on this planet that I was here in this time and age, right? But not everybody has creative wherewithal to or a medium in which to do that. In, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. to say boom or to, to paint it or to yeah. you know to like make a song and everything and stuff. So I look at that, I look at this thing as, as my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, just and, and I can take other people's stories and put like my own funk on it and then give it something different. So how do you balance that that on the one hand you want your own voice to come through. On the other hand you have in TV executives who know this has to be cut together and may not, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've been lucky enough so far. I mean, like I've I've worked with the tops and tops of the business and they just said, make it do it, do it, give us something different. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whether or not it's Ryan Murphy or or, yeah. or, or Showtime and everything, it's like hey, do something and I, mm -hmm. and I if I deliver it's fine, you know what I mean? As long as I deliver it, you know, cool. So let's talk about Ryan Murphy and the yeah. People versus O.J. Simpson. How yes. you got involved with that project? I called up. Um, I knew that they were working on it, um, and I called up Ryan and and, um, and Scott Alexander, Larry Kazarinski, who are USC veterans. And I just said, I gotta give it to John. I said, okay, we gotta get you down here, Ryan. So me, Ryan, and those and uh, Nina uh, Jacobson and, and Brad Simpson sat down. And I said, I said, listen, um, I haven't read Jeffrey Tubin's book, but I read. Read Fred, Fred Resnick's book, <laughs> and I was just like, "Listen," I said. I told him, "I said when OJ was alive and before all this stuff happened, if you were in Santa Monica and you were on Ocean and you saw a big old black head going down the street from afar, you knew that was either OJ or Marcus Allen, and they were living a different life than any other black man in America, right? You know, they they grew up, they came out of segregation." But they were sports figures. They were celebrated by all the white men. Mm -hmm. They could have all the white women they wanted. They had all this money. They had prestige, and they 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 sat. They were they they ensconced themselves in a certain part of West LA in Santa Monica, where that was their fiefdom. And he transcended race. He was OJ. He wasn't black. He celebrated that, right? He celebrated that, and as, he, as far away as he could. And then this incident happened, and it changed and evolved, and they and they became black people wrote him off. I just mm -hmm. told him, I told him what they knew already, but from my perspective, and I said, what I'm worried about is how real you guys are gonna get. Well, we're gonna get real. I said, you're not gonna get real because you ain't me. And I just, and I, I, it wasn't like an interview. It's like more like just me talking to them, just a friend. Like I want you guys. I I, I want to be a part of it, but if I'm not a part of it, just think about this. I was just you know. Just hanging out with them. I said, well, we want you to do So I was supposed to do two of the episodes, but because I sold the show to the same network, FX, I only could do one episode. And they didn't want to tell Ryan that they didn't want, they wanted to pull me from it and just my show. I said, no, I got to do this. This is great, you know. And so I was supposed to do two episodes, but it was a great experience. And they, you know, as I'm shooting it, I mean, you know, in television, it's great because it's more of a producer's writer's meeting. So you have the producers there with you while you're shooting it. But they watched me for a few days and said, you got to do it. You're making it, you know, I mean, and that's what I love. I love when I come on the set and I, you know, and I'm working and people feel my metal and then they like, they have a certain confidence of what they're getting. It's much more elevated than anybody else that they're working with. And, um, I mean, you know, as a professional, everybody wants to have that, you know, like, okay, you know, you do the best in what you do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and I, that's what I loved about working on that. And it was my, my second time working in, in, in TV. So it was like, you know, um, I mean, um, I didn't look at it as a TV show. I looked at it as a film, you know. Yeah. What new things did you learn in that experience about television or about just I, know, I learned production? Because I, I, I wasn't a. I learned more. Like I, I really at film, I'm not really an AB camera person. I'm a, I'm a single camera person. You know, I, I, I think the camera is the paintbrush upon which you know we do our canvas and everything. We, 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 we paint our whole canvas, but. On that thing, there was there was A, B, C. We're in a courtroom, you know, and you know sometimes D. And, and like I said before, I was able to go and think in terms of multi-camera, but not what shooting. Not what I don't call it okay, not shooting junk, 
I shoot very specific small mini masters. I know I want to go from this point. There's, a, there's like a dance move, you know, like every shot has a beginning, middle, and end. There's, it's one, two, three, one, two, three. If I can stand up, I'm one, mm -hmm. two, three. So I'm like, I'm going from A, B, C, and I know that this one's going to dovetail into this shot. So it's like, it's me thinking, but also me feeling and knowing the script and knowing the story and knowing what scenes we're going to do and how this shot's going to tell this. And then here, I want a reaction right here. And then I, and, and I'm able to stop within a take and say, you know, you know, OJ, get ready, get ready. And then give me a good look, give me a good look. And then the camera's moving in and then tell the operator. So I'm telling three different operators what to do at the time and I'm getting those pieces. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's great. Yeah. You know? The inner and sometimes player. it's not, and most of the time it's not even three or four cameras, it's just maybe one or two or A, B. And sometimes it's just one. Some, some shows are just one single camera because they're trying to get as much of the, the filmic cinematic look. So they don't want to use more than um, one camera. They, wanna, mm -hmm. they don't want to have the people, you know, think very, very cinematically and have as much stuff going on within the frame as possible and having interesting master shots glow. So, yeah. well, like I said, with television, as it done for me is it's allowed me to really play my game much more than every other year, or every two years, or every three years. That's what it's done. You know, I'm like on the floor. I'm on the floor. I'm doing it. That episode is remarkable for many reasons. But what you're describing right now about um, how you're anticipating the edits and the way that the reaction shots are working in that episode is really powerful. And I guess I'm thinking about the size of the screens now, right? Like there's a way in which you're getting something very intimate out of the interactions that mm -hmm. are happening. And I wonder if you ever think about how that relates to people watching this, not just like on a television screen even, but maybe a screen that's even smaller than that. I don't think about phones and tabloids and yeah. computers. I, I, it's, I, I can barely do that myself. I, I, think, I think about the canvas. I mean, like, you know, I want it, I want it on the biggest canvas possible. So I'm thinking about you know, wide angle lenses, you know, more more than than not. You know, I mean I want things on a wide angle lens, even if it's close on the subject. I'm gonna mm -hmm. I wanna fill the whole frame with information and stuff. You were nominated for an Emmy for that episode. Mm -hmm. You reflected on that a little bit before, like, you know. But mm -hmm. could you could you say more about what it means to be recognized for that work in television? It, it's phenomenal. I mean like you know, like I said before, I'm really humbled by it. Um, I had no expectations about that. You know, Ryan said it on the set. He said, you're going to get the Emmy for it. For, I was like, I'm not even thinking like that. I'm just trying to make the day and everything. It's just like, um, um, but just, uh, it feels good. It, it feels good. It feels like I've, I've, I'm making a mark in TV as well. And it's something I, I could probably do for a very long time. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I look at people that work on TV and some people had full careers in TV. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know, I feel like a, like a, uh, I, yes, I can direct, but I can also write, you know what I mean? And I'm also um, an idea person, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm a person that basically, uh, I'm a talent magnet. So I pull people along, and I also officiate talent. And so I'm looking at television as, you know, as that thing that I'm able to pull new people in and, and with various other voices and help them, uh, allow them to clarify their voices and, and to hone their craft and do whatever they want. give, kind of give people what I what I didn't have. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you know, someone who can actually understand, you know, what whatever their disparate, different perspective would be, and say, okay, there's a way to 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 hone this into various stories that can be brought out into the world. Yeah. How was it working with Cuba Gooding Jr. Again, it was after all that it time? It was phenomenal working with Cuba, man. He's like, it's great. It was the first time after 20 years, 25 years, we worked together, and we we both like. We both like had emotional moments from that first day we were working together. It was cool. Mm, wow. You've mentioned Snowfall a few times as a TV thing. Well, I mean, because it's such a huge, huge um, canvas to talk about how basically the drugs changed uh, first L.A., but also America, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, you know, if you, if you don't have drugs, you don't have the you don't have the changing of the laws, the drug laws. You don't have the the whole thing with the prison industrial complex and the you know and the, how um, things became even more of a police state and how you, people became more of um, we had a 
now a, 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 a whole population of people that are basically going from uh, from uh, basically what was it called the the, the crib to, to jail. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The whole thing, you know, there's like people are just um, they're cows. They're not thought thought, thought of as, as people anymore. You know, it's like a it's a self fulfilling prophecy of having people basically um, become wards of the state, and um, which costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and that's the broad strokes of it. You know, we, you know, the other thing is that in this pop culture changed, music changed, fashion changed. Um, you know, um, whenever you have any underworld elements and there's a lot of money at stake, you also have different um, different various people from various cultures coming together to do dirty things. I mean, the character on the show, he learns how to sell coke from an Israeli. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like in the valley. So it's like it's like a whole it's a whole different kind of like thing. You know, in the '80s was the time which you know you have twenty. Uh, Less than 20 years coming off of of uh, the late 60s, the turmoil of, of the late 60s, where everyone was trying to hope for a better tomorrow, and that got dashed by a lot of political upheaval and yes. assassinations and machinations, political machinations and and um, industrial machinations and stuff. And so you have you know people wandering around looking for something, looking for they're still looking for the American dream, but how do you find that? Yeah. And the people who would turn to the underworld that never would think think about being in that world. Wow. So you're saying there's so many dimensions of this that it makes more sense to do it as a television? You have to do it as TV because uh-huh. you, really, you could have an, an overall, uh, 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 overall arc that would last for a longer period of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what is that what you would say makes for a good television show rather than a, you know what makes for a good that, film project? That, that's what makes yeah that makes good television because you know it's 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 a voyeuristic medium. You 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 can you have to do stuff that like people cannot take their eyes off of that they can't they're watching and be like I cannot believe I'm watching this shit on TV. That's what I'm all thinking. If you don't have that, then you don't have a good TV show. So then, what's the secret to make for what a good film project is for you? It, it's 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 part and parcel the same thing, but it's it's more of a compact thing. It's more of a mm-hmm. a more kind of like you know the aha moment or that moment where you know you want to go and spend you know ninety two to 90, 92 hours in that in that space mm-hmm. and watching it and paid that money to see it, yeah. and you want to own it. You know what I mean? And you want to watch it again, and you want to tell your friends to watch it. Or you want to, that's what movies are. That's really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you say the industry has changed since you started off? I think they're more risk averse. They're more like they're more averse to taking chances. I mean, I never could have made Boys in the Hood in this medium. I mean, coming out of college and then giving somebody six million dollars, you know, to make a movie. You know, I can't. It's hard for me to get six million dollars to make a movie now. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, let alone like. You know, eight million dollars, ten million dollars to do a whole TV show. You know, so um, it's just totally risk averse. Mm-hmm. What would you say, or what have you seen um, in terms of opportunities for African Americans in the industry now, as opposed to when you started? There's more in TV than it is in, in film. Much more in TV. Why is that? Do you think? Because it's because the audience is bigger and there's more voices and there's more need for product. And it's like you know, it, there's an industrial thing of like. Thing. And then there's also even more of an emphasis on um, uh, authenticity in TV. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that there's a possibility of having more authenticity in TV than it is in, on, on film. And TV is getting more respect now. Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a bigger kind of question okay. to reflect on your own kind of historical legacy, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you think about the work that you've done and the changes that you've tried to make, mm-hmm. do you ever think about what you uh, feel your impact has been? On American cinema? No, not really. I just, I just hope that I just hope that I continue to make really interesting American stories. I want to make mm-hmm. stories that are only really unique to what it is to be um, an American. You know, uh, an African American and, and, uh, and cross culturally. You know, how other people interact. You know, within this idiom, within this, mm-hmm. within this country. That's what I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. It always seems in your interviews that you see yourself as a politically conscious filmmaker, a socially conscious filmmaker. Do you think, think of I'm, yourself that way? I think I'm, I'm not political because I, I could 
some parts of me could give a damn less about what, you know, every, the, there's certain things that political machinations that never are going to change. Mm -hmm. But I think social, social change is always possible. Social mm -hmm. change is always possible with interaction. People interact with each other in mm -hmm. various ways. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I would just say that um, I'm that person that is like, you know, I, like I said before, like Gordon Parks, you know, I'm a cosmopolitan black man. You know what I mean? I have different sensibilities, different artistic sensibilities, different different social sensibilities. And so they all are part and parcel of these films that I make or these television shows I make and me having a conversation with various people through what I'm doing. Yeah. That's what that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this year there have been so many people reflecting on nineteen ninety one, the twenty fifth anniversary of nineteen ninety one. Mm -hmm. And uh it would be great to hear your sense of what black filmmaking was like in that period where there was so much excitement. Right, and yeah, how that well, compares to today. Well, people, I think back then were were really more. They were more trying to, to get a voice out and, um, and 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 these various disparate voices out, but now uh, it's it's totally different from from what now it is now. You know, like no one thought some of the stuff they were were doing back then would be commercially viable. Mm -hmm. Now everyone chases the vibe, the commercial viability. Mm. I don't think people were chasing the commercial viability hmm. back then. I think people now are like, okay, can I do this and get enough recognition to, to you know, get everybody to see it? Like when I when I make certain that's things that are really culturally specific, I'm not trying to say I want everybody to see it. Maybe a lot of people will see it, but they'll see it because of the same reason that someone does a, a potent uh, uh, funk record, hip hop record, R and B record, because it has so much soul and so much heart and so much resonance, because mm -hmm. it's so specific, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's real. It's like, wow, I can, it's just funky, you know. So I'm not trying to, and I think that certain people water down elements of their, whatever they're doing, whether it's a film or TV, because they're trying to appeal to a big wide audience. But the, the audience wants to see something next. They want to see something innovative, you know. Black people in this country always come up with something new and next. It gets appropriated, copied and plugged into mainstream pop culture, and then we go and make something new. So that's that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm that guy that's going to do the new shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who do you think of as your audience? Uh, the audience you want or the audience that you serve, you know? The, I mean, the audience I serve really, to be really selfish, is really me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know if I do something that, that I like, that pretty much people will like it. You know what I mean? And I have very esoteric tastes, but... Like I said, like you know, I've, I've done stuff that just like, you know, I, I you know, I like, like I'm a, I'm a big fan of westerns. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that's the reason why I want to do um, um, uh, uh, Four Brothers because it was my western in the snow, you know, and I knew that if I did it in a certain way, that it would it would it would ha uh, be a very commercial picture because, you know, it's showing uh, brotherhood in a different way. You know what I mean? You have these these various people that are coming together because they're adopted, you know, and and I bond them I bonded them socially in a very way when all we did was party and make the movie and, and make up stuff while we're out in the clubs and everything. It's like, oh, we're gonna put this in the script tomorrow, right? <laughs> and it's like, I know the audience is gonna get that. They're gonna get it. Mm. You know, you see those guys in that movie, you're like, damn, they are brothers. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Do you think of your television audience and your movie audience the as same. different, the same? No, they're the same. It's the same audience. Mm -hmm. it's the same audience. Yeah. And television in general now? How do you feel about it? I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love TV. I love TV. I love movies too, but I, I love movies too, but I, I, you know, like, I'm loving television because it's, it's actually allowed me to, to think about, um, to get on the floor and try different things. And it's getting me even more excited about movies because it's like, okay, I think about, okay, I'm doing this on this TV show, but what would I do if I was doing a movie, mm -hmm. you know, on this thing, mm -hmm. you know? So then when I go and make my next movie, it's going to be totally different from what I'm doing on TV. Got you. What would you say is your greatest achievement? Me? Yeah. My greatest achievement is I've been in this business for over 26 years and I haven't lost my soul. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that are very, very successful that they don't even know which way is up anymore, right? And I feel like really cool that, like I've, I've been, I've had my highs and my lows and stuff, and I like, I mean, I'm happy, you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't have anything that like, damn, should I have done this or, or 
you know, I don't have any of that mm. bile. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like I can't believe that there's successful people who are like angry. You know what I mean? Like, it's angry because probably they made sacrifices that they didn't know that they were gonna make to be successful in a different way. I have just pretty much been, I, you know, I, I've, I've been, I, I call myself the first black film brat because Spike did so much in opening of doors and then going parks and all these people. And when I came along, everybody was looking for an alternative, which was me. They were looking for the next me. Like, so I came in, made my first movie, Impact. So I was like, I'm not gonna take no shit. I'm gonna do what the fuck I wanna do. And <laughs> I got away with that for so much time and I got just to do what I wanna do, right? And I had fun. I had a good time, and I'm still having a good time. Mm. So it's like, and I, when I'm having a good time, I'm like, "Whoa, okay, I have a good time. Your stuff's gonna sell. It's gonna make money. Boom." And then, it, so I'm gonna ride that wave as long as I can. Mm -hmm. You mentioned <laughs> the, the money that you didn't make turning down TV stuff, but I wonder I don't if regret, any, I don't regret if, any if that. you had any professional. Regrets. I don't regret it because if I had done that, then then I would have been doing it because I thought I had to do it. You know, I thought I had to do it, and then it's like you know, you're sitting somewhere, and you're like. I want to be sitting on, I don't want to sit on a set and be like, why in the fuck am I here right now? Why am I doing this shit? Mm. I don't want to do that. I want to do stuff that I'm like, I constantly, like, when I'm on a set, when it's 12 or 14 hours a day, I'm balls out, I'm having, I'm smiling, I'm joking, joking around with my crew, I'm working with the actors, I'm coming, I'm just like, it's an adventure every day. Mm. That's what I want. And then at the end of the day, I just crash and pass out, you know what I mean, like this. I don't want to sit somewhere and I have to sit in a chair and be like, when is this going to be over? <laughs> Because it doesn't matter how much money you get thrown. It's like that when you don't have the spontaneity, when you, when you lose that spontaneity, it shows on, on, in front of the camera it, that, you know, and that won't last. That, mm -hmm. you know, that won't last. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, me, um, I feel like, you know, like when I'm directing, you know, I, I wear really, like really interesting athletic shoes and I'm going from place to place on a set and stuff like this and I'm, 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 I'm thinking on the fly, I'm coming up with stuff on the fly, and it, it's it's like, it's an excitement. Yes, it, it is a job, very much, it's, it's a job, but there's an excitement, there's an energy to it. Mm. And I get off on that energy. And, it, and you know, it's, it's hard to not be able to do that, you know, all the time. You know, it's hard, you know, like, you know, the, to, you know when you're going from, you know, uh, you know, a movie every few years or whatever, you know, when television offers you to go do that. And even if you're not on the set, you're sitting with, other creative types, you're coming up with ideas in a writer's room, and you're like, you know, you're sharing ideas with, 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 with interesting people and their form, informed opinions, you know, it, you know, it's, mm. it's cool. Mm -hmm. What are some of the um, best lessons that you've learned over your career? Me? Yeah. Um, just patience, to be patient, um, to try to, um, um, uh, you know, be real red and relaxed, you know. When things aren't working out, don't panic. I mean, I learned that early on. I learned that early on. I never was a panicker. I never was, never been a person to panic, you know. I mean, outside of this, um, I spent a lot of time sailing, you know what I mean, I, I, out, out of uh, uh, Marina del Rey. I go out to Mexico, I go out on the islands, you know, I'm 50, 100 miles offshore and stuff like this. And that's when you learn stuff, you know, because you're like, you know, you're at the mercy of the elements, mm -hmm. you know, and you get close to God and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so. And it's the same as directing, you know, totally much the same as directing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, in, in that you, there's a certain amount that you have that's in your control, and then there's a certain amount, mm -hmm. a lot of certain amount that's mm -hmm. not in your control. But you're able to try to guide and navigate the whole thing. I, you know, I'm making an analogy now, but it's true, you know. That's nice. Yeah. Do you have a, um something you would call your favorite project that you've done? That I've done? Yeah. yeah. No, they're all like children to me. No, it's not, none of them are my favorite projects. It's all like children to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a dream project that you have? I have a lot of dream projects, but I'm not going to say them a film. Because <laughs> <laughs> we might steal them? <laughs> no, it's just, no, it's, it's, you know, just, you know, I don't remember, my, my mother told me don't talk about it, be about it. You mm -hmm. know, I was always raised like that, mm -hmm. you know.